Okay, well, I think we're uh, ready to call this meeting to order, and this is the uh, January 16th, 2018 Village Council meeting. Judy, would you uh, call the roll? Yes. Housh? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Also present are Village Manager Patty Bates and Assistant Village Manager Melissa Dodds. Okay, so I believe our uh, first order of business is we have a new commission member to swear in. So uh, Joe, why don't you, uh, Joe Carr, come to the microphone. And uh, if you'd raise your right hand. And uh, uh, I will actually, I'll go ahead and read and you can repeat after me. How's sure. that? Okay. Uh, I solemnly swear or affirm. I solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And the state of the Ohio. And the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the Charter. Observe the provisions of the Charter. And ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs. And ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties and will faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Library Commission Member. Of the Office of Library Commission Member. All right. Thanks a lot, Joe. Okay. All right. Welcome aboard. Okay. Next up, we have announcements. Uh, does anyone have any announcements? I do, but I'll go last. Okay. Patty wants to go last? Maybe. I would just <coughs> encourage anyone who has the winter doldrums, <laughs> come to the village building and look at the display on the walls from the Arts Council and a lot of the old, uh, no, a lot of the uh, banners from previous years are hanging on the walls and they are amazing. It's, it, it, it's just fun to hang out there. Yeah, it, it was really incredible to walk in today. And uh, not only do we have the banners up, but um, some of the Yellow Springs Arts Council's permanent collection has been installed already. Um, and, I, and that is one of my announcements. I want to remind folks again that we do have a, the uh, reopening of the Bryan Center Community Gallery this Friday uh, from 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, my understanding is that there's going to be old school slideshow in this room as well as video. Um, there's also going to be music and refreshments, and uh, that includes wine, um, and uh, which actually the village is not purchasing. <laughs> Lisa and I are going to cover the wine. And um, at 7 p.m., uh, we will have an artist talk, and, and we'll hear about the history of the banners. So it's going to be a, a great event. Uh, any other announcements? All right, well, I have a few things I, I did want to uh, add. Um, uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, announce that on uh, February 15th, our very own Jerry Sims is going to be recognized as one of the top 10 African Americans in the greater Dayton area. And uh, I wanted to mention to council members, if anyone would like to attend the luncheon, it's from 1130 to 1 on February 15th. I know Patty and I are going to go um, and it's going to be at Sinclair Community College. We could carpool down, um, but it, it's a really great honor. Uh, the organization is called Parity and um, I, it's just, I'm excited for Jerry and for the village. Um, I also wanted to mention that February 3rd is the quarterly free Yellow Springs Repair Cafe. Uh, if you don't know about this initiative, um, it is an opportunity to either get your appliances or clothing or whatever fixed or to learn how to fix it. And that's going to be at Antioch College in the Sculpture uh, uh, an Annex. Um, and then two thank yous. I wanted to thank uh, everyone that organized the Martin Luther King Jr. Day events. It was so great to have it at the Village. I really thought having it in the uh, Bryan Center Gymnasium was a great fit. Uh, the World House Choir sounded awesome. Our uh, Chief Carlson <laughs> sounded super awesome. And I mentioned that uh, I do have uh, a video of him singing on my council Facebook page uh, for anyone that did not see that. Um, the other thing is I wanted to give a big shout out to our Village crew 
for all the things they did this weekend in the freezing cold. Um, fixing water main breaks, uh, dealing with snow clearing, and you know I will say as a side note because I've been hearing all day about all this Facebook chatter uh, negatively uh, suggesting that the village did not do its due diligence on clearing snow, but I'm here to tell you I was in Columbus today, snow all over the streets. I was in Beaver Creek yesterday, snow all over the streets. I feel that we did a great job, and again, I want to thank the crew for being out there and, and, uh, and trying their best. Uh, snow is something that's not easy to contend with. So, Patty. I just have my regular birthdays are coming up, so I would like to wish Mary Ann a happy birthday here in about uh, a week and a half. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I would like to wish Brian a happy birthday before the next council meeting. So uh, you will be receiving your cards and uh, enjoy your day. You might have even signed your card. Yeah. Oh, see? <laughs> nice. I think I signed my card too. <laughs> um, okay, any other announcements? Um, well, then let's move on to the consent agenda. And we have two items, the minutes from our January 2nd meeting as well as the uh, minutes from the council retreat. And uh, Judy, thanks again for doing a good job capturing uh, the essence of what we talked about at the retreat. Um, so I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. I move. Second. Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Great. Okay, so next uh, we have a review of the agenda. So is there anything that uh, we would like to add, change? This is uh, more of a question, I guess. Nick Cunningham, who is, uh, wants to serve a second term, has been interviewed by us and has sent his notice to that effect to Judy. Do we have to swear him in again? Or can we just nominate him? I don't think he was ever sworn in because he came on before that practice uh, was put in place. And so generally I try to catch people if they've never sworn in. Uh, I don't believe that he was initially. So I, I think we could invite him to come to be sworn in, but I guess the reality is not all of our commission members I'm do. I'm just going to suggest that in this weather um, it would be difficult for him to get down here. I, I mean, I'm wonder, I guess I'm going to put it to council that, that I, I'd, I'd be, I'd like to just swear him, get him into a second term. Well, we've got folks who still haven't sworn in just because they've got work <laughs> obligations or various things. It's the second, second meeting of every month is swearing in. So there's no, no big rush. I mean, he, he could come do it when he's ready and prepared. Or I was thinking, uh, I'll I'll go to the next HRC meeting, and swear in anybody that's. Oh. How about that? So, okay. All right. So, do we want to add that to the agenda then? If you're going to come to HRC, I mean to in. I mean to nominate Nick. Oh, okay, sure, yeah. Okay, so we'll add that to new business. Anything else? Okay, great. Um, so, Marianne, uh, petitions and commission, uh, communications. Yes, we had two uh, communications. One was from Community Solutions. Community Solutions is applying for some grants to uh, help fund a bike path that would run from Agraria, from the barn of Agraria, potentially through the uh, property of the high school. Uh, and they would that they would like council to support this grant by uh, sending in a letter of support and it needs to be done by August 1st. February 1st. February 1st, excuse me. I don't know where August is. <laughs> Agraria, hey, they both start. <laughs> so um, should we, I'd, it seems like it would be good to make a decision at this council meeting. Yes. Would you like to do it now or put that on new business? I feel like, unless anybody wants to discuss it um, I, I certainly support the idea. Yes, I agree. Okay, and and I'm willing to draft the letter. Okay, so uh, is everyone comfortable with having Brian draft the letter? Yes. Okay. 
Okay. Then the other communications was from Greene County. And uh, Judy, can you pull down to, oh, that's probably at the very end, huh? The thing is, I wanted to, to, to show what the website was that people could go to. So the Greene County Public Health Department has sent out a notice about um, radon. Uh, I didn't realize it, that radon is caused by the breakdown of uranium and that it's the second leading cause of lung cancer and that, um, according to the Greene County Health Department, and we are in an area of relatively high radon occurrences. So uh, this is the kind of thing that can happen through your basement or your crawl space of the vapors just creeping up into your house and you don't know it. So there is a website and it, it uh, I don't know, if, well maybe people at home can see it, it's www.uchd.net backslash radon and if you go to that website you can get a free kit you put it in your house and then you I think you send it then well, the instructions are there but send yeah. it back to Green County yeah I actually did this a couple of years ago I, I got a free kit I, and I did find out I had radon in my house and had to have it mitigated so um, it, it is I encourage everybody to do it in this area because there is a relatively you know high incidence comparatively speaking to other areas and um, I mean, you know, I, I did this, got my free kit, followed the instructions, mailed it back in, and they said, mm, yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and mitigating involves, I guess, usually putting some kind of ventilation system that pulls the air. It's, yeah, it's not, uh, it, it's, a, it's a venting kind of system to vent it away <laughs> and out into the atmosphere where it breaks down mm -hmm. um, and therefore doesn't affect anyone else. But um, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's very important and um, I, I strongly encourage folks to do this. <laughs> so, yeah, I also had to, I also had that in my home. So uh, especially if you use your basement, if you have it like redone and all that kind of stuff, it can, it's really important to yeah. have the mitigation if you've got it in your home. Yeah. Those were the two communications that were in the packet. Okay, great. Um, so we're now going to move to public hearings and legislation. And before we read in um, the ordinances, Chris, could you come up and tell us a little bit about sort of what we're doing here? Twenty eighteen oh two and 03? Yeah. Um, okay, so this is a, a follow-up to the previous at the last two meetings of council where we discussed the issue of uh, the uh, uh, House Bill 49. This was uh, two pieces. Uh, one had administrative housekeeping uh, that was recommended by uh, Rita, who administers the village tax program. Uh, there were some changes that I'll call them mistakes that were part of the legislation of House Bill 5 that was passed back in 2015. And um, in our code section, we have Section 881, which pertains to income tax. The Ordinance 2018-02, which I'm asking to be passed by emergency, are clean up to that 881 code section recommended by Rita. Now, Ordinance 20. 1803 is not, it's essentially here for first reading. That pertains to the legal challenges that have been initiated by Rita and another group of municipalities and a consortium of, of interests that has been filed in, in uh, Lorraine County and Franklin County, respectively. The Franklin County case, the judge there has issued a stay on the implementation of the provisions that are being contested that pertain to uh, the, the net profit tax for businesses because of the attempt by the state to have the payments of those taxes controlled through Columbus with a percentage, a poundage fee for administering that tax. Um, municipalities throughout the state strongly object to that as a violation of home rule authority and therefore it's unconstitutional. Uh, in that case, the, the State Attorney General Mike DeWine's office has signed off, uh, has signed off on that stay. Um, it is briefed. We expect the decision sometime at the end of February. Um, when House Bill 49 was passed, the, uh, 
the expectation was that all municipalities would approve the change <coughs> on or before January 31st. If a municipality did not approve the changes, in theory, the state could impose some sanction of some kind on municipalities who were acting in defiance of the state authority. Um, in light of the stay, in light of the circumstances where there may be some discussions and give and take, by way of example, on the mini cell tower issue that was passed last year, there were legal challenges, and that has gone back to the legislature for changes. Um, there's been some ill-conceived legislation coming out of the state of Ohio when the municipalities fight back. There seems to be some greater discussion and compromises worked out. House Bill 49 seems to be in the same uh, method or same process. So the short answer is 2018-02 are housekeeping the changes that we need to make regardless of the outcome of any litigation. 2018-03 is a placeholder for the first reading as we, in preparation for what may be legislation that we have to pass when we know the outcome of the litigation. Okay. Thanks, Chris. And I'm sure we'll have other questions, but I just wanted to, since this is kind of a, some special legislation, I wanted to have a sort of and overview. One of the things, this is in my solicitor's report, but I also want to point it out uh, when I was talking to Judy about this on Friday. Um, it's a little confusing when you first read the title because we make reference to income tax regulations effective beginning January 1st, 2016. That is a reference to House Bill 5. But because House Bill 5, when we passed this in 2015, was prospective in its operation, the old tax code of the village was still applicable at that time. So in other words, think of it this way. In the same way you pay your property tax for last year, not the current year, the tax code is still has application for people who have tax issues that date during that relevant period of time, which dates up to 2015. So we left the date of January 1st, 2016 <coughs> in the code so people would have an understanding of what code section they needed to rely upon. Mm -hmm. The anticipation is, is that once that, uh, once the, the look back period for the old tax code goes away, that we would come back and we would simply repeal and remove any reference to the old tax code from, from our codified ordinances. We're just not there yet. We've got a couple of years left. We can do that. Okay. So Thanks, Chris. That's a great more confusion. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, then uh, ordinance 2018 02. Judy, since we're being asked to uh, do this as an emergency reading, could you read it in in full? Sure. This is repealing Chapter 881 Earned Income Tax Regulations, effective beginning January 1, 2016, of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Chapter 881 Earned Income Tax Regulations, effective beginning January 1, 2016, as recommended by the Regional Income Tax Agency and declaring an emergency. Whereas codified ordinance chapter 881 of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio provides the municipal income tax regulations for the year 2016 and subsequent years, and whereas the attorney, whereas the General Assembly has determined that it is necessary and appropriate to further amend chapter 718 of the Ohio Revised Code, setting forth statutory requirements for municipal income tax codes and has done so by enacting House Bill 49, Whereas Village Council has determined that it would be in the best interest of the Village to adopt a new Chapter 881 entitled, entitled Earned Income Tax Regulations beginning, effective beginning January 1, 2016 of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio to update the Municipal Income Tax Code in accordance with changes to Chapter 718 of the Ohio Revised Code and the required changes are effective for the taxable year beginning January 1, 2018 and thereafter. Now, therefore, counsel for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1, Chapter 881, entitled Earned Income Tax Regulations, effective beginning January 1, 2016, of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be repealed. Section 2, a new Chapter 881, entitled Earned Income Tax Regulations, effective beginning January 1, 2016, of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be enacted to read as set forth on Exhibit A, with new language underlined and bolded, and deleted language in strike through in strike through, which is attached here to and incorporated herein. Section three, this ordinance is hereby declared to be an emergency under home rule powers for the purpose to amend the Yellow Springs income tax code within the time period specified in House Bill 49, which will preserve the public peace. This ordinance will take effect immediately upon adoption. The passage of this ordinance does not waive any rights of the village to continue its participation in case number 17 CV 194026 in the Lorain County Court of Common Pleas, and the village expressly reserves the right under its home rule powers to specifically challenge section 
section 803.100 of House Bill 49. Okay, thank you. Can I get a motion? I move. Second. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, since this is emergency le legislation, I will open the public hearing. Um, council, any questions or comments? No. Okay, uh, any questions or comments from citizens? All right, Judy, can you call the roll? I can. McQueen? Yes. Stokes? Yes. Krieger? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. Housh? Yes. Okay, so now let's move to uh, Ordinance 2018-03, and um, uh, yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, Judy, I, I think we should again read this in full. You got it. Thanks. <laughs> this is repealing Chapter 881, Earned Income Tax Regulation, effective beginning January 1, 2016, of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Chapter 881, Earned Income Tax Regulations, effective beginning January 1, 2016, and declaring an emergency. Whereas in House Bill 49 of the 132nd General Assembly, the state's general appropriations bill for the biennium includes Section 803.100, purporting to require that municipalities on or before January 31, 2018, adopt certain munici municipal income tax provision that are also adopted within House Bill 49 to authorize state officials to collect and administer municipal net profits taxes. And whereas Section 803.100 of House Bill 49 references and relies upon Section 718.04a of the Ohio Revised Code, Code, which purports to make municipal income taxing authority conditional upon a municip municipality's adoption of code sections as dictated by the state. And whereas although the municipal income tax provisions of House Bill 49 and Section 718.04a of the Ohio Revised Code violate the Home Rule Amendment, the village nevertheless is compelled to adopt House Bill 49's <coughs> municipal income tax provisions to avoid any doubt or taxpayer challenge as to its ability to impose a municipal income tax under the terms of Section 803.100 of House Bill 49 and Section 718.04a of the Ohio Revised Code. And whereas the village is a party to ongoing litigation seeking a declaration that House Bill 49 municipal income tax provisions, Section 718.04a of the Ohio Revised Code and other provisions of Ohio law that usurp the powers of local self-government are unconstitutional, and to enjoin all actions by state officials to implement the House Bill 49 municipal income tax provisions and a stay has been put in place that extends the deadline to make certain changes until February 24th, 2018. And whereas the village by enacting this ordinance does not concede the legality of House Bill 49's municipal income tax provisions, Section 718.04a of the Ohio Revised Code, or any other law that is subject to the suit in which the village is participating and reserves its right to continue prosecution of that lawsuit, now therefore counsel for the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby ordains that. Section 1, Chapter 881, entitled Earned Income Tax Regulations Effective Beginning January 1, 2016, of the codified ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be repealed. Section 2, a new Chapter 881, entitled Earned Income Tax Regulations Effective Beginning January 1, 2016, of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, be enacted to read as set forth on Exhibit A, with new language underlined and bolded, which is attached hereto and incorporated herein. Section 3, Village Council hereby expressly finds and determines that it does not concede the legality of House Bill 49's municipal income tax provisions, Section 803.100 of House Bill 49, Section 718.04a of the Ohio Revised Code, or any other law that is subject of the action pending in case number 17CV194026 in the Lorraine County Court of Common Pleas, or any other legal challenges filed in the state, and that the Village reserves its right to continue its participation in and prosecution of the said lit litigation and any other litigation challenging the state's authority to dictate municipal tax collection and administration, and that adoption of this ordinance shall not prejudice the claims of the village therein. Section 4 of this ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Can I get a motion? Move. So Second. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Chris, actually, I'd like you to come back up. Um, and uh, I, I know I have a few questions. I don't know about other council members. but. Um, could you explain, um, you know, all the new language, language talks about uh, whether somebody elects to follow this process. Um, can you just elaborate on what that <coughs> means? I, candidly, I haven't studied that aspect of it because I think it's, it's evolving. But as I understand the law, um, the a local business could opt not to participate in the centralized collection scheme. Now, I don't know what the, what the factors are that a company or business might consider. 
I suspect because this has to do with the situs tax about where you're actually doing your business. So if you were shipping to other counties or you're a contractor, for example, and you're performing services in other counties and there was not a fixed business location where your customers are coming to you, so if you're doing business in Franklin County, for example, I think that it hasn't, it, 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 there's implications to how the collect the tax is allocated based upon where you work. But right now you just pay your taxes in the place you live. Okay. And so I think that's what it has to be. So if, if you don't elect to use the, uh, you know, the, what are they called, the business gateway, then um, you would use RITA? It would be status quo of what? I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. I, haven't, I haven't dug into the, into the nuances of this yet. I mean, I certainly can prepare a solicitor's report for the next meeting um, and then flesh that out. Right now I've just been dealing with making sure that we're, we're engaged in the litigation and making sure that we have the legislation as recommended by Rita um, before our council so that we don't miss prospective deadlines um, and run the risk of some consequences that we didn't intend. Okay. Um, Incomplete answer, but I can get more. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. And then presumably we could educate our citizens on these options if this does go forward? That's my interpretation of how the law is written. However, I think that there's still a piece of that, which is how do you do business? Because part of this is designed to capture internet business, internet commerce. I mean, if you recall years ago when you would make your, your internet transactions, you didn't have to pay sales tax. Um, and so I think that this is a, a legislation that's designed to, to address some of the issues regarding e-commerce. Okay. Uh, council, any other questions? Well, I just want to clarify, this is for business profit, net profit, not individual income tax return, unless an individual is a business. I would think that's a fair amount. Okay. Um, well, this is a first reading. Uh, we do not need to vote, um, but if uh, citizens have any questions or comments at this point, um, welcome those. Okay. Um, and then uh, I guess the other thing that Chris did explain to us is that we might need to pass this as an emergency depending on the outcome of the litigation. Um, but at this point, in my mind, without more knowledge, I don't think it makes sense to, to vote or, or really discuss this until we know more. So we'd only vote, need to vote once the right. second reading. Right. Um, okay, and then we will know at our next meeting whether we need to pass it as an emergency or not. Uh, um, they have until the 24th of February, right, Chris? If one accepts what the judge said, the timing of what the judge has ordered. <coughs> okay. So you may okay. not know at the next one, but. Okay. So we should table it, correct? Um, well, I, th I think we've just, <coughs> we've done our first reading. <laughs> Um, and so uh, I'm not sure that we need to table it. You, you could actually just bring it back and read in the title okay. again the next and the time second and reading, wait right? for a third reading to pass it if you should need to do that. You can okay. extend it to a third reading. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, okay. So then we're moving on to resolution 2018-02. Um, and Judy, you can just read that in by title only. Well, now you tell me. <laughs> Adopting rules and procedures for council. See? All right. Uh, can I get a motion? I move. Second. All right. Um, so <clears throat> we discussed this at our last meeting. Uh, we made a couple... Uh, adjustments at that meeting that are reflected um, in the updated version. Judy, do you just want to highlight what um, what is different from what was in the packet? Yeah, I had uh, missed, maybe it was wishful thinking, I had put in the intended uh, time of completion of the meeting at 9 o'clock and it is actually to be 9.30, that's changed, and then order of business uh, chief's report, assistant village manager's report were added in and um, hearing of uh, standing reports was moved after um, the clerk's report where it does in fact normally go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions or comments? Judith? Um, I, 
I didn't bring this up the last time, and I don't know if this is where it should be, um, or, if, or there, if anything needs to be done about it, but I did, you know, want us to be just cognizant of the use of emergency ordinances. I think I mentioned that before. Um, that, that there is a really pressing reason when we make legislation, emergency legislation, uh, you know, the purpose of not having everything be the, an emergency or not having emergency legislation is, um, or a regular legislative process is so that the first reading happens, there's two weeks, there's a second reading, people have an opportunity to really look at the legislation and, and sometimes citizens want to have input. Um, and it, it, it's not this very fast process and there's a purpose to that. So I guess I just wanted to, I don't know if there's, it needs to be anything here, but what do you think? So are you thinking about adding uh, well, I didn't bring any that, language, so um, so that was a question. I wasn't sure if this was the, if that it should be here. I know there's regular legal language around it, um, but I just wanted us to be cognizant of it at least, mm -hmm. at a minimum. It says um, issues that need to be. Oh no, that's emergency. That's, yeah, it, it doesn't really address it at all, and so I don't know. Uh, I wasn't quite on top of it when we were discussing it previously. But. <laughs> well, um, I mean, we can always amend it. That's true. So I don't. I mean, I'm okay with going forward with it, and you know, if it seems like this is a place where we'd want to put a sentence or two to that effect, um, we can do that. Yeah, and I like that idea. I, I think also um, it would be good to articulate what emergency yeah. legislation right. means, just so there's no confusion. I mean, I think a good example is, you know, what we just passed, which is yes, we needed to take care of the housekeeping to collect income tax. So, um, okay. Well, I think there are some exceptions maybe to some financial, uh, I'm not sure. I understand there are some exceptions that are, you're allowed to do emergency legislation kind of on a regular basis. So, you know, just delineating that so would be good. Okay. Maybe. That sounds good. Um, any other questions or comments from council? Uh, questions or comments from citizens? Okay. And by the way, part of our uh, part of this is also to make sure to turn your cell phones off. So I didn't say that at the beginning of the meeting, but make sure that they're silenced. Um, okay. Uh, so all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Okay, we're now moving to citizens' concerns. This is the time in the agenda when uh, we entertain uh, any comments or questions that are items that are not on the agenda. And uh, we ask that you do come to the podium and state your name. And uh, we also uh, limit the time to three minutes. So, do we have any citizen concerns? All right. Great. So we are now moving into uh, sort of the highlight of today's meeting, uh, which is our special report. And uh, so we are going to have a presentation about the housing needs assessment. And uh, all right, sounds like we're getting ready here. Sure, yeah, so Patty, if you'd like to uh, Hey. to uh, get us started on that? Um, absolutely. Um, as everyone knows, um, the council put out a, a request for proposals and um, we did contract with Bowen National Research out of Pickerington, Ohio to do a housing needs assessment for the village. Um, this evening, Patrick Bowen is with us to make that presentation. Um, we are going to be a little bit pressed for time, so we do ask that in, unless you have a very specific question about the topic at hand, if you could hold your questions until the end of the presentation so that Patrick can get through the presentation, and then um, we will answer all the questions at the end, and that might make it flow a little bit better because there is a lot of information that he's going to uh, impart in a short time. So, Patrick. Um, 
sorry, we're switching over from Judy's laptop to Patrick's laptop, so. While this is happening, I'll, I'll just say a few words. Um, several months ago, uh, council determined that it wanted to have what's called a housing needs assessment. And we put out a request for proposals and decided that uh, Patrick Bowen and his company, Bowen Research out of Columbus, was the best company to do that. And we have been very happy working with Patrick and his team which uh, part of the housing needs assessment included a survey to the community. Over 500 people responded. And now Patrick is here to give us his take on all of this. Nice 400 paint something. <laughs> <laughs> well, Happy New Year to everybody. And, uh, Happy New Year. It's good to be back. Things are a little different since I was here in September in front of council. The weather was slightly warmer then, but uh, I'm glad to be back and to uh, present our findings here today. Again, I'm Patrick Bowen, uh, president of Bowen National Research, just outside of Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we're a national real estate research firm, and so we do housing needs assessments uh, throughout the country, and it's kind of nice to do one so close to home, and uh, so I can get back to my family here this evening. <laughs> um, I want to thank uh, the committee. Uh, they did a great job of uh, kind of spearheading things and <clears throat> give me good guidance on what I needed to do. Um, Patty Bates, I, you know, I have to acknowledge you as well as you, Mary Annie, you both were you know, incredibly helpful uh, getting us in contact with the right people, the right resources, and uh, to do this in essentially three months that we did this, you know, it couldn't have been done without your help and the committee's help. So I, I do thank you for that. Um, also, uh, you, you had mentioned, Mary Ann, the uh, the residents, we had a lot of residents response. It's a record for us. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, stakeholders, community leaders that were involved. And I was just today, just before I got here, I was tabulating on how many you know, people somehow, some way were involved with this project. Not just Yellow Springs residents, because we also surveyed housing and, and, and got information on the region as well. But more than 700 people somehow, some way were involved in the process of getting input. So there's a lot of collaboration and input on this report. And so that says a lot about uh, this community. Uh, certainly, and, you know, Patty had said, <clears throat> so if we want to hold questions towards the end, the only thing I'll ask is, you know, I know that some of these uh, images might not be uh, clear just to the size of the screen. So if there's something you need me to clarify, absolutely, I'll be glad to stop and, and do that. But if it's more on what does that mean and how did you get that, that'd be the kind of stuff I'd prefer to we hold towards the end just to make sure we can make it here today. So, all right. So <clears throat> this is the scope of work. We looked at a lot of de demographics and uh, economic trends. We spent a lot of time doing research on housing itself. So we surveyed over 100 apartments. Obviously not all those here in Yellow Springs, but over 100 apart multifamily apartments in the region. I got information on more than 3,200 for sale housing units. Uh, surveyed 26 senior care facilities, so very robust uh, housing inventory that we put together. Uh, we did we collected a lot of information. I'm not going to present it all here tonight on what we call other housing factors. So that's you know the community services, crime, transportation, uh, uh, drive time of residents, and things like that. I do cover some of those things, but there's some of those I don't cover. So certainly for those that had a chance to review the report, if there's something you want me to elaborate on that I skip over. Uh, so, you know, I'll certainly do that with you. Um, we, and as we had said just a moment ago, we got a lot of input from residents and stakeholders. Uh, we did the demand estimates on different types of housing and different price points. And then we concluded by providing housing uh, uh, strategies and uh, priorities for the community. So the quick thing just to understand, so uh, you'll see tables or references to uh, the primary study area or PSA, that's Yellow Spring. So anytime I say PSA, or you know, that's Yellow Springs. And the other thing we did was we established a secondary study area because Yellow Springs you know, doesn't operate in a vacuum. You are getting impacted by, and you impact the surrounding area. So we established a secondary study area. The community had some input on that. We looked at a lot of different things in terms of demographics to understand 
what would be the, the geographic area that influences Yellow Springs. And so we established a secondary study area that includes you know, Springfield, Xenia, Beaver Creek, and Fairborn, uh, as well as the smaller areas in between. And then I believe when I was here at council, uh, someone had suggested or asked if we could do something with the uh, Dayton Metropolitan Statistical Area to include some of that data. So we have some of that as a base of comparison. So that's the purpose why you want to see some of these other areas, because as I present, you know, uh, poverty rates or growth rates or uh, vacancy rates of housing, whatever it is, you want to understand how does Yellow Spring relate to the surrounding area or even the state of Ohio in some cases. So I do present some of that. Okay, so I'll just first kind of go through some of the, the key demographics, some of the stuff you folks know, but I think just to see, just to give you an understanding of really what your community can currently consist of demographically. And uh, the first one we, we came across, or at least I felt was pretty important to uh, present, was the sense of how many seniors you have in this community. You have a large portion of seniors. The uh, median age is over 50 years old. This is by far the oldest community I've ever studied. Doesn't mean there's not other communities that have older populations. I'm saying this is very unusual. We even have it in here in that first bullet point. If you can't read it, you know, comparing just the surrounding area. If yours is your population median household, or, I'm sorry, median age is 50.1. The surrounding area is 37.3. The Dayton MSA is 40.3. The state of Ohio, 39.9. So you're much older than surrounding areas. That matters. That affects what kind of housing you're, you have right now and what you're going to need in the years ahead. In terms of um, the largest shares, I show in the graph, it's the light blue um, is basically the uh, Yellow Springs area or that PSA I was talking about. And again, you probably can't read all the numbers on the, the, the graph itself. But the 55 to 64 age group is the largest in terms of households. Uh, 65 to 74 age group is the next largest and 75 and older. And so you can see compared to whether it's the secondary study area, Dayton or Ohio, you've got a larger gap or larger number of people that are much older than the surrounding areas. All right, this is um, household sizes. Always important to understand in terms of, you know, what is our composition of households and size. And the thing that stood out here, again, light blue is, is Yellow Springs. You have a lot of, a uh, lot more renter households in that far upper right-hand graph. This is renter households by size. You have a lot more one-person households. And part of that is because you have an older community, so you have a lot of older people that are living by themselves, or in the case, you have a lot of two-person households. Again, older couples, empty nesters, kids have left home. So it's not too surprising that, that you have so many younger, I'm sorry, so many smaller household sizes just because of the age of the area. But that in itself still tells you something about housing needs. As you think to the future, you're going to have to think about well, what type of housing should we have. Now, keep in mind, the data I'm showing you here is what you are today, not what you could be. And I will show some projections, but in the end, one of the things council and the community has to think of and as overall is you, know, you will have an effect on a lot of how this community grows demographically. And so you can make policy decisions and offer incentives and things like that uh, that could uh, obviously change some of these uh, projections that we'll show you. And then the bottom left-hand graph is owner household by, uh, household size. And again, you just have a lot of one and two-person households um, in this area. The thing I wanted to point out is really unique is the, the fact that whether you're talking about renter households or owner households, you don't have a lot of large family households. Uh, the, the, the percentages are very small. And so part of that, I think, is the fact that you know, there's some affordability issues here in the community. I also think, and I'll show you here shortly, a lot of the housing stuff that you have doesn't accommodate larger families. So if this community wants to um, embrace and, and attract larger family households, one of the things you're going to have to think about is how do we get housing units that would appeal to those folks. Right now, you don't have a lot of larger families, uh, four-person or larger family households in the market. This is um, the breakout of renter households by income, and then on the right-hand side is owner households by income. So first off, one thing just to acknowledge, this isn't unusual to have a lot of lower income people being the renters and a lot of higher income uh, people being homeowners, but I think the disparity is, is a little bit unusual. So you have, you know, basically two-thirds of your renter households making less than $50,000 a year over 40%, make less than $25,000 a year. That is significant. And in terms of owner households, you know, a large share, more than half, make over $75,000 a year. 
So with that in itself, I'm going to show you shortly how is that going to change in the next five years. I, I do have a question. Um, so you're talking about we don't have larger households and you're suggest, you were suggesting, if I understood you, that's because we don't have the stock to accommodate larger sure. households. Sure. But are you, how are you coming to that? Have you, were you counting number of bedrooms and homes? Because when I think about a lot of our stock, we actually have a fair number of large houses here, but only one or two people might be living in it. Some, so correct. So, some, so we're, and I'm going to show you that here shortly in the housing stock. On the rental side, you don't. You don't have a lot of uh, three-bedroom uh, three units or larger. The owner, owner side, you do. Um, but still, uh, you don't have a lot available, and that's one of the yeah. key findings as well. I'm going to share with you okay. here. But uh, did you, when you look at the stock, do you actually look at the number of bedrooms? We did. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll share that. Okay. Good point. This, I don't, I've never showed this before, but I just thought it was so profound I wanted to share it with you. The community is incredibly highly educated in terms of those folks that have a college degree, two thirds of your population has a college degree, less than 2% do not have a, a high school degree. And when you look on the graph on the left, the light blue is uh, yellow springs. The last two sets, again, it's comparing you with the surrounding area and Dayton, NSA, and the state of Ohio. Um, but you see just how significantly uh, different you are in terms of uh, the highly educated community. That itself affects earning capacity and potential of residents. Your median household income is so much higher, it's about $63,000. Uh, it's much higher than the state of Ohio, which is closer to 50,000. So higher educated population leads to some higher incomes that are um, obviously in the, in the area. The other one I wanted to show was the, the turnover. While it's not a, a big difference, you have 12% of the population generally turning over a year relative to the other areas. That's not a high turnover rate. That means when people come here, they want to be here, they stay here. Now, I think that's part is the appeal to the community. People don't want to leave. But I also think it's lack of supply again. You don't have a lot of supply, so even if Patrick Bowen lived here and, he, and I wanted to move somewhere else in town, I would be counted as a person turning over that year, I don't have a lot of choices to, to move to, whether as a homeowner or a renter. So the lack of supply is kind of keeping that number down. But I do think it also, people get here, they, they want to stay. And you'll see that in the resident survey that we'll share with you in a little bit. Uh, this is the uh, distribution of households by income overall. Now, I showed you a minute ago the distribution of renter households by income, and I broke it out by owners. But I wanted to show you this. So you have a lot of people that make some, some good incomes. Clearly, those that make over $100,000 is your highest share of, of households in the market with 27% uh, making over 100000 But the other thing, I just want to contrast that with population that lives in poverty. So you've got a lot of people that live, uh, live well and do well financially. But you have some share of your population still lives in poverty. And the bottom graph on the far right-hand side is 14.1 percent is the overall poverty rate for Yellow Springs. That's actually a little bit lower than the region, the Dayton MSA, state of Ohio. Not much lower, but still lower. But what I do want to point out is when you look at children under the age of 18, and that's on the far left-hand side of that bottom bar graph, you have almost a quarter of your kids live in poverty. And so that is significant. And you have a lot of families. You, know, you have a lot of families. Overall, you still have families that are living in poverty. That in itself affects the housing needs of the community. Okay, this is a uh, cost burden. And so essentially cost burden households are those that pay over 30% of their income towards their housing costs. So the top graph is the percent of cost burden households, whether it's the renters, this is just Yellow Springs. It's, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side of the graph is Yellow Springs. The left-hand side with the blue, the light blue again is uh, renter households, the darker blue is owner households. So as you compare on the top graph, you know, you don't proportionally, compared to some of these other geographical areas, the surrounding area, the Dayton MSA, the state of Ohio, you don't um, have a disproportionately high share of people that are cost burdened. You still have a lot of folks that are paying this, this uh, undue cost. And then severe cost burden, those that pay over 50% of their uh, income. Uh, towards their housing costs, and they are renters, it's 21%, and homeowners, 3.4%. So in numbers, on the top part anyway, those are paying over 30% of their income towards housing costs. That's renters and owners combined, that's about 400. 400 households that are bearing a, a high burden of, of uh, housing costs relative to their income. So again, affordability is, is a certain issue that, that uh, matters. 
All right, and the next several uh, slides I'm going to go through is that these are projections for the future. How is Yellow Springs going to change over the next five years? And uh, the thing that I mentioned just a moment ago, too, is, you know, keep in mind this community can dictate or influence at least uh, how these projections change. But these projections, even my demand estimates that are, that are at the end of the report and I'll show at the end of this presentation, that's as if nothing changes. If this community moves forward as it's expected to do, you don't do anything different, the economy doesn't change nationally or locally, then these are the things that should materialize. So as you can change policy, for example, <coughs> did something that helped homeowners or renters or low-income people or seniors, or whatever it might be, then these projections could change, and that's going to affect ultimately the demand numbers for the, this community. Um, so the only thing I want to share with you on this population trends of the top graph is, yeah, the top graph is 2010 to 2017, is the light blue bars. And so you can see the, the Yellow Springs area, which is that first two sets of PSA, on that label. Uh, that is Yellow Springs growth that it has been, and it's been faster than surrounding areas except in the state of Ohio. And then in terms of 2017 to 2022, it's projected to continue to still grow over 1%, and that's faster than all three of those areas that we compared. Now, in terms of numbers, because percentage-wise, the community's small, so it might look bigger, but you're still going to have an increase in the population of uh, 47 people. Uh, it's 26 households over the next five years. So. Again, if nothing changes, you're still going to grow. And you're going to have to uh, obviously address housing needs. As I show you here in a few minutes, there's just not much available. So where are these people going to go? Another trend that, that's important for the community, and this is um, the growth over the next five years in terms of uh, different age groups. So as you can see, with the first bar on there is the, those that are between the ages of 25 and 34. Those are projected to grow by over 22%, uh, which is 40 households over the next five years. So those, which I grouped as millennials, just to keep this simple. The millennials, in this case, you're going to have growth in that age group. There will be certain uh, housing expectations and needs that those folks will have. And then in terms of those that are over the age of 65, you see that there's a lot of projected growth. Now, one of the things to point out, is you can, if you can see it on the, on the, the screen there, that age 55 to 64 is, is declining. The 65 to 74 is growing. Well, part of that is just people aging in place. So, you know, if I'm 61 years old today, in five years from now, I'm going to fall up into that age 65 age group. So it's not like you're losing all those groups. They're just shifting into this, these older age groups. So that's all that is. Sometimes people get panicked and they see some of these drops. It's just people are moving from one age segment to another. This is predicted growth. Um, over the next five years in terms of renter households on the left, owner households on the right. And so as I showed you earlier, the, you know, the concentration of renter households are among low income households. That share is going to grow. The highest concentration of owner households is among the highest income households. That is going to grow. So it's already kind of a, a disparity between the renters and owners in terms of their incomes. And those <coughs> segments are going to get bigger. And so you're going, it affects needs. So in terms of future housing needs, the need for owner households that are Price in terms of renter households or rental housing units, there'll be a need for some of the lower income housing units as well as some of the moderate ones that meet the needs of those that make between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars a year. At the uh, council meeting in September, this is one of the things I was asked to just make sure that I cover, and this is this was uh, this was surprising uh, how much it changed in terms of racial composition over the last 40 years. In 1970, uh, minorities represented 27.4% of your population. In the year 2010, it dropped to 20.6%. So percentage point-wise, that doesn't seem like a big change, but that second bullet point is really the, the critical finding here. You had over 1,200 people that were minorities in, in 1970. And that has dropped down to uh, 719. We lost 567 minorities in a 40-year span. So this area has become less diverse racially. And um, we have maps and other graphs in there, but that certainly is a significant uh, finding from this report. Economic, just quickly, you know, the economy is growing. You have more people employed in Greene County now than you did prior to the recession, so you've fully recovered. Uh, unemployment rate at the end of 2016 
uh, was represented a 10-year low. So the economy is doing really well. The economy, your logo economy here in Yellow Springs is, is pretty well balanced. Manufacturing is a little, little high uh, relative to some of the communities we study. So you, know, you are a little bit vulnerable to downturns in the economy like Northeast Ohio and Southern Michigan and Northeast Indiana saw when the recession hit in 2007, 8, 9. Uh, those were heavy manufacturing areas. They got hit during the downturn. You've got a lot of manufacturer and employment here. And so, you know, I'm not an economist, but just looking at what I see in other parts of the country, when you rely heavily on certain industries, it can make you vulnerable. So as this economy grows, certainly you want to look at other job sectors that might be opportunities to just uh, balance out your economic base. <coughs> if I had to flag a handful of findings, other than some of those demographics, this would be one of those moments where I think I would, you know, I would make sure this is kind of locked in your mind. And that is, you know, where are people coming from when they work, or who leaves the town during the day to go to work? And so you have over 2,000 people at some point are moving around for work purposes. You have 1,200 people that are coming into town on a daily basis to work here. Now you have about 800 or something like that, I think, that we're leaving town for the day. But you have 1,200 people coming in. That is an opportunity for Yellow Springs. If you're trying to capture people in Vancouver, you want here, where well, you want people that already work here, you want them to live here, you want them to spend here. And so in terms of trying to think about what kind of a product that affected some of our recommendations, <laughs> so you try to think of what kind of uh, workers would be coming into town and what kind of housing might accommodate their needs. You folks know this, just from, the, I think, being here, but I think just, you know, statistically to see it, this is the distribution of renter households by uh, the age of the product and it was built. And so you have a large part, almost 80% of your renter ho rental housing stock was built prior to 1970, which is the light blue in that first batch of uh, bars, compared to um, surrounding areas in the state of Ohio, which are closer to 50%. You just have a lot of older product in terms of the rental supply. You don't have very much uh, new product, product, rental product built since 2000, it's just over 4%, which is lower than the other geographical areas. The owner housing stock uh, is the same, but it's not, the, the, the disparity is not as significant. You still have a lot of older owner-occupied uh, housing stock, um, and you've added some uh, since 2000, about 7%, so not that much different than the surrounding areas. So the real disparity was among the rental housing stock, just much older. Um, in the surrounding areas, and I'll, I'll explain, I think, some of the implications of what that means for the community. We invested a lot of time in terms of just inventorying housing. So one of the things we did was we surveyed uh, uh, multifamily apartments. So we called apartment managers or leasing companies, and we collected information. And it, it is incredible how much information is in the report. I'm going to cover 2% of that here today. There's so much great information, not just for the community, but then even for developers that are coming to the community that want to look at investing here, building here. They're going to have a lot of information at their disposal to make some judgments and then figure out you know, what is the competition and what can I expect in terms of, of uh, building my own product. So um, we surveyed 13 rental properties here in Yellow Springs. These are just multifamily rentals. So gener generally, this is anything that has four or more units or five or more units, give or take. Um, and then region-wide, we surveyed another 91. So we wanted to compare in the top table to show what you had versus the surrounding area. Um, and in both cases, there's just really not much available. The rental housing stock here out of the 237 units, multifamily units we found, there was only four vacancies. So you don't have much to choose from. Uh, so if you're a prospective renter or you're a current, current uh, resident here in town now, and you're just trying to decide, hey, do I stay here because uh, my income grew? I just got married, I just I got kids now, whatever. You're not going to have a lot of choices to move around the rental market here in Yellow Springs. You do have choices uh, elsewhere. And I think that's, that's this Yellow Springs at a competitive uh, disadvantage here because it, it, people that are making choices are going to choose you versus other communities. They've got a lot more choices here in terms of rental housing. And uh, that's significant. This is the breakout of all the market rate apartments. Again, 123 units and within nine properties, um, and then 65 market rate properties surveyed in the region. Um, in the end, again, there was not much available. The thing that I thought was interesting, uh, at least initially, was the, the pricing, of whether you rent here. I know this is a big issue in the community. It came across in the, the resident survey. 
is affordability. And so when you look at the rental rates, median collected rent of a rental here, Yellow Springs, relative to the surrounding area, they're not that much different. But here's what is different, and I don't, I don't have a slide for it, but I do have it in the report, and that is, what are you getting for that money? So if you were to rent uh, one bedroom here in town, you're going to pay you know, just over $500, might be $575 in the surrounding area. Yeah. And, uh, but in the surrounding area, you've got so much newer product. They have so much more amenities and features. Um, they're higher quality that if, if a renter, and I, and I think this is particularly true of millennials, is if they make a decision, they're, they often, not always, often have high expectations in terms of what should be in that unit. When they look at the housing stock here, market rate housing, in Yellow Springs, they're going to look at this community and go, look, I, I love this town, and I want to be here, and this, this is the atmosphere I want to be in, but I don't have the kind of choice I want. I can go to these surrounding communities and I'm going to get these nicer features with all the you know, microwave ovens, the washer and dryers in the units, and nicer finishes and stuff like that. And so that was one of the things that, again, it's in the report, I don't provide a slide, but it, you'll see all those comparisons of amenities, quality, um, the number of bathrooms, square footage, all those, and you'll see the surrounding areas beat Yellow Springs every time. And so that is important as this community moves forward, you've got to think about what kind of housing, rental housing, market rate in this case, what kind of housing should we have going to compete with the surrounding community? So that's a pretty important part. Tax credit apartments. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, the, the most basic way to explain it is uh, tax credit, it's a federal program. The state of Ohio manage, man, manages their own program. Tax credit housing serves households that uh, make incomes up to 60% of median income. For a four-person household here in the Yellow Springs area, that's about $40,000. So you can't make over roughly. $40,000 in the tax credit project. So it's serving the, the segment of the market that is maybe below traditional market rate, higher higher end stuff, but not as low as <laughs> subsidized housing. So we didn't have it, we didn't survey any uh, non-subsidized tax credit uh, units here in town, and yet there's about over 600 of those in the surrounding area. And here's what's happening there is everything's full. Every single tax credit unit in this region that we surveyed, because we surveyed every project, but it does say everything we did survey, which was a fairly big survey, everything is full, they've got wait lists, there's high demand for tax credit housing, and in fact it, the need's not being met clearly because the wait lists are so long at some of these projects. But this just shows you the rental rates for um, surrounding area in terms of tax credit projects. And if you compare that with those market rate rentals that are here in town, they're very comparable. And so if the theory is behind these tax credits, these are only affordable to people and yet they're comparable to Yellow Springs market rate supply, something that's not right. If you, again, a study will have this, and we have it actually on every individual project we survey, we have the details on all of them, but nonetheless, if you look at these yellow, I'm sorry, properties outside of Yellow Springs, these things, again, are much newer, have more amenities, they're bigger units, they have nicer features, things that people want in today's marketplace. And so that's why these can get the rents that Yellow Springs is currently getting for market rate. Government subsidized, I mean, we, we see this all across the country. Government subsidized housing serves people that make uh, up to 50,000, I'm sorry, 50% of median income. So that would be, again, for a four person household, probably closer to $30,000 a year, putting all those things. Uh, everything is full, uh, virtually everything is full, and uh, most of the properties have long wait lists. Uh, I think one of them we surveyed had over 120 people on its wait list. So long wait lists for government subsidized housing, it's always in high demand. Um, whether it's here in Yellow Springs or in the surrounding area. Unconventional rentals. So one of the other things we try to capture is, okay, you can rent an apartment, what else can you rent? Well, you can rent what we would classify as non-conventional rentals. So this is anything that's not in a traditional multifamily apartment project. Typically, it's four units or less. So it could be a house, it could be a duplex, it's somebody you're renting. Now, that data is not available on every one of those rentals, but this on the far right hand side are the gross rents, meaning the rent somebody pays plus their utility costs. That is the rents that they pay in Yellow Springs, the PSA, compared to the SSA. Most of those are non conventional rentals. There's some multifamily housing in there. I think Marianne, you were asking me about that at the committee meeting. This is mostly non conventional rentals in this. So, this is a good representation of um, what a non-conventional rental might rent for. And I highlighted in yellow just so you can see where the bulk of the units are in yellow screens. And most of them are pricing between uh, $500 and, and uh, $1,499. Now, 
This is just what people are reporting that they paid through ACS, which is a, like a census reporting entity. When we, when we did our research, we couldn't find a rental, unconventional, less than $1,000. So if somebody can't find an apartment, multifamily apartment, which I explained was very affordable, <coughs> but another choice is I can go look for a non-conventional rental. We didn't find many, eight or 10, something like that. But you're gonna pay a lot of money for that unit. So again, lower income people, families that are young and, and trying to make their way, they're gonna have a tough time finding rental housing, whether it's a multifamily apartment or a non-conventional rental. Airbnb, which most folks are aware of, it's just short-term rentals where someone might rent out their home or a room, um, sometimes in the unit that they actually own. Um, we looked on Airbnb's website, there were about 24 of these uh, such rentals. Um, most of these are studio or one bedroom units. There's not many that are, are bigger, but three-fourths were studio or one bedroom. And then we got the rental rates, which are in the table. Those are nightly and weekend uh, rates. If you, if you converted this over to a monthly rate, people would theoretically be paying over $1,500 a month to rent one of these. Now, one of the things that was really helpful to us was we got a lot of information from uh, operators of Airbnbs here in town. I was surprised at the response I got from our request. And essentially people were coming back and saying, look, we don't rent these out year round. When we do rent them, you know, it's, it's often short term. We want to keep these for ourselves part of the year. I have a family that comes in for the summer or the holidays or whatever. So these are not long term rentals or not, nor should they be perceived to be such. Um, and unless uh, these were converted over to full-time long-term rentals, uh, you know, property owners are going to keep these as, as these nightly rates you know, because they can make some uh, decent money off of them. So I just I don't think this is really impacting the local housing market at this time. Marianne. Yeah, I think that we had agreed, I think, that the 24 included places outside of Yellow Springs and the number in yeah, I, Yellow right. Springs is closer to probably 12 or 15. Yeah, I think it's I closer think. to I think 15 or 16, you're correct, yeah. So I think initially when we did our research, we couldn't tell which ones were in or out of the village mm -hmm. limits. And then through the help of the committee, I think it's closer to about 15 or 16. But again, a very, I, in fact, I think I didn't get anybody that came back to us. We got 10 responses out of those 16. Um, here in Yellow Springs, I think ten of the people told us they don't rent these out like <coughs> here. So. For sale housing, the only thing I really want you to, to notice, and that's why I circled it, is the median price. So on the left hand side is the Yellow Springs product. Again, there's not much available, nor has it been much sold in the last three years. But regardless, what has been sold or is available is priced well over what is in the surrounding areas. Almost triple in terms of what's available and then more than double uh, what's been sold in the last few years. So you could find affordable housing, for sale housing in the surrounding areas. Now we didn't evaluate the age and, and condition of those homes because it's thousands, but I suspect those are older homes and if you're buying a house at $82,000, chances are you've got you know a lot of money you've got to put into that to keep it up, to maintain it, modernize it, things like that. So while someone may believe a low-income family could go purchase a $82,000 home, there, there's, there's all other financial considerations that may not make those uh, affordable to them. But anyway, so let me jump into what we found in terms of both the available housing stock and what's been sold. So this is historical sales. We went back three years. <coughs> and in Yellow Springs, not a lot of homes have been sold at 34 in this time period. And the bulk of those units, though, are in that 150 to and 250, I'm sorry, 299 range. And so the graph you know, illustrates the, the lighter blue or royal blue is anything in Yellow Springs, the darker blue is anything in the surrounding area. So most of the product in the surrounding area, that's why we have that median, lower median price, is priced under $100,000. And as you start to move up in price points, that's when you start to see the greater inventory of product that's being sold in Yellow Springs. The other thing to point out on there is uh, average DOM on the far right hand column of the, both of the charts, that's days on market. And that's just how long a home's been listed before it's sold. And it's 72 days overall in Yellow Springs. That's a short uh, days on market. Uh, what we're seeing around the country is closer probably to the region at 92, closer to 100 days before a home sells. So when homes come on the market here, they don't last long. That's showing obviously the demand for for sale housing is high. 
And this is, a, again, a comparison of the, oh, this is the, the available inventory. Uh, now, the time we did this, this would have been in October. Yeah, October. Um, we only found four listings. I think when we checked again in early December, um, it was closer to 12 or 13 um, that were non-pending sales. If I wanted to go buy a house today, I had a choice of 12 houses. So regardless if it's four houses or 12, you don't have a lot to choose from. And so that in itself is putting Yellow Springs, just like the rental supply, you don't have a lot available. You don't have a lot of available in terms of the for sale housing stock. So that does put the community at a disadvantage if you're trying to attract people and uh, allowing your own residents to be able to move around as their personal circumstances uh, change. Now you obviously have more choices in the surrounding area, but it's you know, primarily under the you know, $200,000 price point. Um, but nonetheless, if you're trying to compare a housing option for Yellow Springs versus the surrounding community, you, you, uh, you've got certainly more choices outside of Yellow Springs. Senior care housing, so this would be you know, independent living. Congregate care is, is like, like independent living, but they might have a dining facility or uh, a meals program or uh, housekeeping or something like that. And then there's assisted living and nursing home. So the thing to take away from this is when we surveyed the properties, we compared you know, occupancy <coughs> rates in that fourth column over with national occupancy rates. And keep in mind, these occupancy rates and these, these properties we surveyed would be in the region. If you have one facility here in Yellow Springs that offers three levels of care. But nonetheless, in the region, uh, the, the independent living is comparable to uh, in terms of occupancy, uh, to national averages. There is no data for congregate care. Um, but in the region, you're only at 80% occupancy, which is, is not good. Uh, assisted living's at 87%, relative to the national average, it's slightly lower. The nursing homes is slightly above the national average. So generally, this region's performing okay in terms of senior care facilities. Um, I, do, I do know the facility here in town, when, when we talked to them a while back, um, they did have uh, some vacancies in their independent and their nursing home beds, and they didn't have any available units in the assisted living. When we ran some demand numbers, and I won't show that here tonight, but when we ran demand numbers, there is a little bit of a need for assisted living in Yellow Springs, but the numbers aren't big enough, I think, at, at least now, uh, to attract development. I suspect, though, with your such, such a large your population of those persons over age 55, 65, um, that's going to change in the years ahead. So this would be certainly a segment that I would watch, but this would be something I would be cautious of if, if somebody were to come forward to the city or to the village and uh, present a project. If you can't do it, I would just be uh, cautious. How are we doing on time, Patty? Mm -hmm. Did I start on quarter jail? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, accessory dwelling units and lot splitting, these were two items you folks had asked us to look at, uh, the information that the village provided us. There were eight permitted um, ADUs um, between 2015 and 2017. So it's not a lot of these units are being um, uh, created or built. Um, in terms of lot splitting, there were six lots that were split into a total of 13 new lots. The thing I took away from this, number wise, these aren't big, but I think in a community that doesn't have a lot of available housing, uh, anything you can do to encourage development, you know, a little bit helps. And so as I showed you a moment ago, you know, we found four homes that were available for sale and four rental units. So anything somebody can do, even at the small level here, of adding to uh, an ADU and making that a unit available to a renter um, certainly is going to help, help the issue. Yes, real quick, I just, it's not tied to housing, but it's one of those other factors we look at. And I just want to point out, your, your crime risk index, which is a, uh, I can explain that if, if I need to, but in the end, the national average is 100. So if you have a crime index of 100, that's the national average. If you go below that, you below the national average. Above it, obviously, you're, you're higher than the national average. So look at relative to the surrounding areas of the Dayton MSA or state of Ohio, your crime index is 87. This is a safe community, and so certainly that's something you want to promote. Uh, purely developers that are thinking that's something they're always watching for, what kind of community I'm coming into. So I just thought I'd throw that in here just to make sure people were, were aware that it was safe. Development opportunities. One of the things that uh, I was asked to do was to look at uh, what land you might have available. This doesn't mean it's, I'm sorry, land that's potentially available to be developed. It doesn't mean it's available to be purchased, it doesn't mean it's zoned residential. Um, doesn't mean that it uh, doesn't have floodplain issues or any other issues. It's just saying if you have land available, how much do we have? Because there have been communities that I've studied and they've got such little land left that even if there's a need for housing, there's no place to build it. 
you don't have that problem here. When we did our estimates, and there's a lot of things we, we go through looking at different parcels and buildings and what can they physically accommodate. But physically, excluding um, Glass Farm site, you could probably fit, potentially, you could fit 700 units in the village. Now, my experience tells me, though, when you start to factor in zoning, flood, flood, plain, flood zones, stuff like that, you really, that number's usually much lower, like half of this number. So you may, if I just had to estimate, if I really did dug in deep and started looking at every parcel and the specifics of it, density requirements and, and things like that, the number's probably half of that 700, probably closer to 350. That excludes Glass Farm? Does, yeah, and Glass Farm, which I'm going to show you in the next slide, it, at minimum probably could do about another 100. So if you just want to take the, the, the village overall with Glass Farm, it's, you could probably do 800. But what's really buildable and ultimately could be built upon is probably closer to are, are any of those sites actually available? No, that's what I'm saying. Some of them are not. Some, are some of them are any of them? I don't know. I, I think some of them. I think some of them we did identify. In fact, I know they're they're the for sale signs are out. So I don't know which ones, but some of them are available for sale. Yes, I would say more are unknown whether or not they're available. Then we you know for sure. And some may never be sold. Right? Some may hold on to other purpose. Some of them aren't even zoned as residential and may never get switched up. So that's why when I say 800 units could physically fit, to scale that back to reality, it's probably much lower. That's what I'm saying, maybe half of that number. Glass farm site, now keep in mind, we only looked at it as from a marketability standpoint. I'm not an engineer, um, so we didn't look at any of those kind of things. But just from marketability, when we look at visibility, accessibility, surrounding land uses, how close community services are, employment, the highway, stuff like that. This is a marketable site uh, that would appeal to developers. Um, and based on its size, there's a lot of different types of development that can fit on this. And we were used kind of traditional development standards, what would a developer need to build one single house, how much land, or a multifamily apartment. We came back with estimates that you probably do roughly 130 single family homes or 327 multifamily. So there's a lot of things that affect that, how many stories you do, and again, density and, and other things that might impact that. But just to give you perspective, and that's roughly what could fit on this site. Um, when we ask stakeholders, because I don't have this in the stakeholder summary that I'm going to share with you in a minute, um, they mentioned that detached home for sale housing as well as rental housing could be uh, good uses for this site. In terms of affordability, we asked we had asked folks, stakeholders, what they thought. Mixed income seemed to come back as the, one of the more uh, common responses. Although they all acknowledged that market rate or affordable could be done, um, I think most stakeholders felt mixed income might be appropriate for this site. And and not that I, I did it for this, but you know you could have an analyst come in and evaluate just this site and then its demand potential for different income levels and stuff like that. But this housing needs kind of gets to that point. You, know, you need market rate housing, you need affordable housing, you need senior housing, you need rental, you need for sale, you need all those things. So all those kind of feed into, you really have a, a fairly open slate for this site. You could do a lot of good things because this community needs a lot of it. How would you define mixed income? It, it, it could be government subsidized housing to serve 50% or lower of median income. It could be tax credit housing. It could be market rate housing. And market rate hits the whole spectrum of moderate to workforce to you know, higher end market rate housing. So uh, it just depends. It mixed income could be any, any, really any income level. Mixed income in terms of a mix of income within that development, or that the whole development would be one would be targeted at one segment of the. You, you well, you could have you could do anything. You could really have one one building, uh, one one uh, developer come in and build some apartments that serve market rate housing. And that could be it. You could have somebody else come in and build some cottages for seniors that maybe are for sale. And you have, so you could you could have different income levels of different uses, or you could put it all you could put one building in that has a little bit of everything in it. Alright, this is the survey uh, from residents, 580 respondents. Yale Springs is now the new champion of our uh, surveys. Um, 
Yes. But is that a proportionate winner or a, like a pure no, response? No, you pure winner, even bigger communities. Um, really? Yeah, you beat them. Wow. Hmm. Um, that says a lot about the community. I mean, people were engaged, they care. We did this through online, but also the village did a great job. I suspect you may have had some uh, influence too on just getting even hard copies out for people and then getting them collected back. So this was a, a, a great uh, response and it made, it should make you feel like it makes me feel. It's like, look, I, I do this for a living. I can guide and give advice and give numbers. You all have your own background and knowledge, but residents also have a chance here to speak in large numbers. And so what they had to say is, is I think, pretty telling. And a lot of it really backed up a lot of the, uh, the research and data that we found. So we talked about affordability or some availability, all those things that we found. And the stakeholders also told us, well, guess what? The residents told us the same thing. So the only things to point out here, the stuff in yellow, People are satisfied with where they currently live. They like the, uh, the vibe or the feel and the diversity of the community. It's a welcoming community, desirable of, uh, desirable area neighborhoods, and prefer uh, preferable schools. Much harder to read on the upper right hand side um, in terms of just housing issues. Now this was interesting. This kind of reminds me, and as elected officials, you, you probably are attuned to this. It's like we always hear how people don't, you know, they're upset with Congress, but they like their own congressman. Well, it's like here in the community, people like their home, they like their neighborhood, but they think overall the town has an issue of housing. And so that was kind of, it was interesting to, to get that dynamic, because a lot of times when we do this, people don't like their home, they don't like their neighborhood. The community's got problems here that you didn't have. The people, for the most part, were happy with their own place, but they thought there were still challenges ahead, or challenges in the community. And that was, um, you know, <clears throat> current housing in the market is uh, poor, fair, it was 80 over 80 percent of the people but there's something not great about the housing market. They commented about high prices or rents, uh, property taxes being issues. Um, when we asked people you know, what kind of uh, other challenges they might have found, finding suitable housing was one of the big ones. Um, again, people could find housing, obviously they're living here, but maybe it wasn't what they wanted or what they need, or what their, as their uh, housing situation changed, their needs changed, and so now they can't find what they're looking for. Uh, affordability, as I mentioned, housing cost, uh, limited overall housing supply, and inventory. So all the things we've kind of been hitting on here tonight, the citizens are saying the same thing. Affordability and availability are, are, are big challenges. In terms of housing needs, the, the citizens felt was important was low cost and uh, moderate cost rental housing, and that's the key, is rental housing uh, for families. Um, even though we had a high, you know, a high share of uh, seniors here in the community, we had a high share of people that responded the survey that were seniors, guess what, they're still saying families need help. And they weren't saying we the seniors need help, though I, I think seniors need this help here as well. And nearly half of the respondents uh, said there's a need for apartments in Yellow Springs. And then when we asked them about uh, challenges that they, they, they felt um, were significant, a lot of them reported that they were paying a high share of their income uh, towards their rental or their housing costs, I guess. And again, lack of affordable housing was key. Theme. Stakeholder surveys. Um, this is again input from elected officials, community leaders, uh, real estate professionals. And I just want to do this quick because I do want to jump into the, the recommendations piece. But in the end, you know, the, the, the respondents, the stakeholders essentially said many of the same things that the residents were saying. You know, rental housing is needed, low to moderate market, I'm sorry, low to moderate income housing, energy efficient housing was commented on. Uh, some mentioned special needs populations, uh, live work. Those were probably less um, less critical to, to the stakeholders. The third bullet point mentioned the, what level of demand. And when we asked about what you consider high demand, they mentioned single family homes followed by apartments, and about half of the respondents. Uh, the fifth bullet point, the bottom left, the highest need of people the stakeholders felt were those earning less than $75,000 a year. And here you see it again, housing issues. Stakeholders said the same thing that we found and the same thing that the residents said. Limited availability and affordability are the challenge. A lot of folks bought new construction or renovation uh, of properties were probably priorities for the community. And when we asked about programs, home buyer assistance was the probably most common response to that. And then barriers to development, again, just quickly through these availability of land, cost of land. These are not unusual financing. I hear that every single community you go to just trying to find financing to do projects, cost of labor, uh, materials, um, 
Um, it's been a common theme around the country, so no different here. Some stakeholders mentioned, you know, maybe annex and land could be a solution, uh, encouraging infill development. Uh, other suggestions included partnering with uh, developers, creating incentives for landowners to, develop, or to sell land, uh, encouraging developers to, uh, to put some units set aside uh, for low-income households. So, uh, what Philip was, was mentioning about you know affordable units as an entire project, or could it be mixed income? You know, this might be a case where you have some like inclusionary zoning is a common thing that's going on, where you you as a community could you know indicate, look, if you're going to come into our community and build market rate apartments, you we want you to set some aside for <coughs> whatever that, that entity it is. It's low income households, whether it's disabled, whether you want to set some aside for homeless or whatever. So that was suggested as well, and we've seen that um, happen a lot around the country. Uh, eliminating lot size and square footage requirements were some of the suggestions to help developers along. Um, offsetting increasing housing costs, again, availability of uh, additional real estate for uh, people to develop on. I'm not sure what stakeholders meant totally by that. Um, balance of different types of housing types, I would agree that you know, people are suggesting that, you know, you want rentals, you want owner, uh, home, home sale units, uh, you want to serve different populations. Uh, innovative design was mentioned, and again, it's, uh, I didn't do this on purpose, but maintain an affordable uh, rental market, so again, affordability is coming across as important to the stakeholders as well. All right, last couple slides here, and that is uh, overall housing market needs. Uh, again, we looked at a lot of things, we match up the demographics, the growth trends of the market, as they are expected to occur. If you don't do anything different, what is your existing housing stocks? We match those up, and in the end, we come back and we quantify. There's a whole section of the report that talks about how we do it. But in the end, we come back and indicate roughly how many units you can do with these different types of, of housing. And um, so there's a potential to do a lot of different things. Uh, one of the things I wanted to stress, and in fact, it's right in the, you know, the table itself in bold print, is you know, incentives or government policy changes, um, things like that, uh, that could encourage, uh, or I guess in some ways discourage certain development. Obviously, it could uh, change what kind of demand could be uh, created. I give this, I always give this example. It's a silly example, but I think it gives perspective. You know, if I said that there's a need for uh, moderate income for sale homes, and by definition, for you know what I might use. Uh, that might be a $150,000 to $250,000 home. Okay, so demographics are saying there's a need for about 30 of those, roughly, based on who you have and where you're projected to go. But if somebody were to come in and build housing at 140, it's kind of below what these people would want. Well, guess what? Those people don't have a choice here. They're going to gravitate towards this lower price product. So developers themselves can dictate you know, how demand's going to change just by how they set their prices on it. So that could affect demand as well. So developers affect it, decisions you folks make, the community makes could affect the demand. I have a question. Yes. Can you go back there? So how did you come up with the high income for sale homes at 120? That seems to be the largest segment that you The biggest driver of that, if you remember, if you go back to that one slide where I had the demographics and I showed renter, households by income, and owners, your biggest segment of your growth is going to be in that higher income, <coughs> those that make over $75,000 a year, owner households. So that's where your growth is going to occur. If you do nothing different, people's incomes are going to climb, as well as some people will, will come here. And so that's where that demand is driving that. So and, and, these and, these are not what you're saying. We are should be our goal. This is what you're saying would happen if nothing's done. Correct. Yeah. This gotcha. is this is what's okay. going to have, mater, should materialize. This is the need. So I, as a developer today, just wanted to, to figure out. Look, I want to build some homes or condos or whatever. What can I build? If I want to build some apartments, and I do low income tax credit. What do I think I can do here in town? So this is showing if nothing changes. They can come here. They can come here and invest in this community, and there is a need for this type of housing. You can change those numbers, and you can increase the demand because if you offer certain incentives, that might help offset cost and allow developers to make their product more affordable and stuff like that. You can obviously change some of those. But if you're saying already the housing main need is even more on the low end, low end. The affordability issue is the main issue. Um, I don't quite get why we would want to encourage that. Well, he's not saying we would. Okay. 
Well, I'm having a little trouble understanding. He's just saying this is the way. This is the drift. If we don't do anything, this these are the kind of houses that would be selling in the drift. Okay, so, okay, so, so you know, the, a lot of the theme has come back from the residents, from stakeholders, and I and I think based on uh, how many low income people are paying a high share of their income towards rent, for example, how many low income people do you have, how that share is going to grow. Okay, that drives demand for affordable housing, whether it's the subsidized or low income or whatever. But that's not the only statement that's changing and has needs. And I'll give you another example. On the for sale side, um, uh, high income for sale, sorry, 120 units, which you pointed that one out, you have virtually nothing available at the high end. And so a good market, you need to have some. So just, just to have an opportunity to have a healthy market so that people can move around. Is there, again, I wanna, I'm a renter, but I just got this great job. My income has just increased substantially. I want to go buy a nice house. I don't have a place to go to. But you want a market that has that, that choice for them. So you want to have vacancies. You don't have it. So just vacancies alone, you need to increase the number of vacant units. The same thing for rentals. I mean, the, the squeeze that's upon the renters in the community, you don't have anything available to them. As an owner of a property, that's great for me, right? I, my place is full. I don't have trouble renting it. I don't have to invest. I'm just hypothesizing here. I don't have to invest in um, making my product a little nicer and updating it and taking out the carpet because people are going to take it because they don't have any other choices. So you want, as a healthy community, you want the, the landlords do have that pressure on them to make changes and, and upgrade the housing stock. You want to have vacancies because you, you need units available for people to move around. So again, as their, 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 their housing situation changes, incomes, marriage, Death, whatever it might be, you have a ch you have other choices. Because you don't have it, so that those get those get built into this. So part of the high end one, and that's one you were raising the question on. You don't have available high end homes. You need some for a healthy market. You have high projected growth for high income households. You need housing to accommodate that. So that's where that's, for example, is where that's coming. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, and I just have these two pages of recommendations. Um, do we want to go through these, Patty? Do we want to just open the questions? I mean, I'll go through these really fast. There are summaries of each one of these recommendations in, in the report itself. I just got kind of a bullet point. Of what's the main takeaway from these recommendations? Set realistic goals. Uh, again, you just asked, are these our goals for the community? Well, you, you know, that one table of demand. In a way, it helps guide in terms of priorities of housing needs. But you as a community can decide. Hey, what is it we want? Do we want to be a retirement community? Do we want that? We, we, we want to have homes or housing that accommodate our seniors that need to downsize. We've got a lot of seniors that at some point are not going to be able to financially afford to stay in their homes. Physically can't, don't want to. The house is too big. We need housing to accommodate them. And that in itself, by the way, if you, if you build senior, it's hypothetical, but if you were to build some kind of senior-oriented housing, seniors move out, they downsize, now you free up all this housing, and now you've, you've solved two problems, because now you have all these homes that are free for entry level or whatever type of home they might uh, Support efforts enable standardized mission seniors to transition to housing that meets their changing needs. Uh, explore programs and initiatives to assist uh, developers of housing and residents seeking housing. There's a lot, there's a, um, an addendum in this report that covers all kind of programs across the state of Ohio and it's at the federal level. And uh, so there's some suggestions in there of uh, programs that could be considered. Uh, we talked about a lot here tonight, supporting affordable rental housing for seniors, low income, and even the workforce of folks. Um, development, uh, encouraging development of higher end for sale housing. And again, each one of these, I go into a short narrative just explaining what could be done and what does this mean. Uh, support special needs housing with the disabled and the homeless. We have well, a section of the report that covers those folks. And so, yes, ma'am. So, are you saying the wall of affordable rental housing is um, did you also see a need for affordable for sale housing? Uh, there's some entry level, yes, absolutely. So when you saw on that one, I'm getting my own, I can see all of it. There's entry there. So the bottom three is basically for sale housing. So when you entry, say entry, that would be like? Probably that 150000 or even you know, a little bit lower price point. And we define those in the court. Okay. Then we have moderate income. There's some need for that, maybe 150 ish to two. And then obviously the higher income households and the corresponding price. 
By the way, I, I, want, I just want to make this comment. You know, somebody could look at this and go, well, you pretty much said you could do everything. The one I did want, obviously, I didn't say you could do senior care. I really would be cautious. But I truly believe this community has the opportunity. You've got such, you so few vacancies in this market. And you can get all these changes that are occurring in terms of your households by income, and renters, and owners, and age groups, and stuff like that. It's all dictating that you need all this type of housing. So that's a good thing for a community. You've got a lot of choices that you can make. It can be broad. Um, we talked about special needs. The last two bullet points, you have a lot of older housing stock I mentioned before, so preservation and renovation of existing housing is important. So things like code enforcement and things like that would be important. Um, this last one, what percentage of Yellowstone's housing is accessible for people in special But, but it's clear that that's a should be a building priority for developers. Yeah, because this I will tell you this. I, I we couldn't find a project that was exclusive to like disabled or anything like that. So there's probably units set aside, but I don't, I don't think we captured that in one. Uh, and then, as I mentioned earlier, exploring you know uh, ultimately trying to do something to retain and attract the land. So there's a lot of that innovative things that community can uh, at least a native product that I think the community could encourage. And then the last slide here, um, as I said, you don't have a lot of uh, lots that are available or parcels that are available for sale, um, but you have an opportunity to continue to promote development in smaller lots. Uh, one of the things that, you know, before this started, I think I mentioned it to Marianne, is that when I work with other communities, one of the things that they I've learned from them is when they move forward with recommendations, they always try to start with something that's achievable, like to get the ball rolling. Let's pick something that's not this you know, major undertaking that's going to take us a year or two years to achieve, but what is something we can do? So in that second bullet point could be an example of just start identifying developers that you want to you know, make aware of your community. Sharing this study, sharing the PowerPoint, for example, is just one way sharing data with them and informing them up. We have that section of the report that talks about the land and the buildings that are available and things like that, that developers would find, I think, informative and could help speed up their process and make Yellow Springs interesting to them. So that, that could be just one of those early steps. Encourage development partnerships, uh, whether that is with nonprofit groups, profit groups, um, the housing authority, I and mean, any of those types of entities. Uh, redevelopment of vacant land, I'm sorry, vacant and unused structures. We only had, um, I think four buildings that we were aware of that, that you could possibly fit some units in, they're not very big, but nonetheless, uh, doing something with the vacant parcels and vacant buildings obviously would be beneficial. Uh, balanced market, I've stressed that multiple times, so we go in and talk about low and high income households and how those, both of those segments supposedly, I think what you were getting to, we need, we need both, we need both segments served. Some of the racial, socioeconomic diversity issues, um, outline some ideas there. It's not necessarily housing, but there's still things that can be done. Uh, Family-oriented housing, uh, clearly if this community wants to embrace families, encourage families, obviously there's ramifications at the school, schools and so forth, but nonetheless you don't have a lot of families here and um, you might have an opportunity to attract families uh, with the right product. Mixed income, multi-generational housing for the glass farm site is something that we, we thought could be uh, beneficial to the site and beneficial to the community. And obviously next steps uh, plans. I know that I think um, one of the things that I believe folks are thinking about is focus groups next. And so that will be a good probably next step to think about how do we now, there's a lot of recommendations, there's a lot of information in here and so forth to help kind of maybe drive a discussion for focus groups. So that might be a good next step. So with that, I'm open up to questions. I can really ask what I... No, no, you did, you did good with time, I think, with the questions. You really fit it in. You did a good job. That was a great uh, summary of the executive summary, <laughs> <laughs> which is what I wish I had when I was reading the executive summary. That, that, that 450 pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, indeed. Didn't even try it. But I did uh, go through the executive summary and uh, refer to a lot of the, the figures and charts that you referred to in the executive summary. By the way, my name is Kevin Stokes. I don't think we've met. Um, I'm a new member along with uh, Lisa, new member of council since, since you were last here. So I took notes and I'll, I will go through these quickly. In fact, I, I will make you a promise. I will ask you a question that I will attempt to answer it for you. <laughs> 
So, so with the secondary um, survey area, the SSA, uh, you mentioned count, uh, cities in uh, Clark and Greene County and some of the small areas in between. Did you specifically just focus on the cities and try to exclude the rural areas? Yeah, it's, okay. It's that whole area. So when you see on the map, it outlines the secondary study area. It's everything that's in it, excluding Yellow Springs. All right. So okay. Okay. So, towns so you picked up rural properties as well. Okay. Can right. I can I knit, can I just add a little knit question to that? I noticed part of Xenia wasn't in the secondary area, and I wondered why that was. Well, one of the I've got advice and recommendations from the committee that we took into consideration, housing committee. But then we also just look at demographics of the area, trying to match up what areas have some similar attributes. Got it. Um, how many, uh, what's a typical drive time to work? Where do people commute? So it, a lot of things went into trying to draw those boundaries. Great. And one thing to keep in mind for everyone, you know, that, that secondary study area, just to get perspective of, again, are we growing faster or slower? Do we have more seniors than they have? And how those, how do we, uh, our trends changing over the next five years to these? So it gives you some kind of basic information. Thank you. So, okay. Thanks, Kevin. Sorry. So make a great team. That was good. <laughs> that was, so that was one question. I had half and she had half. Um, these next questions are pertaining to Cresco Labs. Um, so your projections in terms of income. Now, do you, or it, it, you know, future income and things of that nature. Now, I know by the time your study was completed, we probably hadn't gotten official word on what Cresco was doing, but I was just wondering, in, in the draft form um, uh, of your study, did you consider what that what Cresco Labs might mean for the, for the village? We did not. And, and you know, the, all the demographic projections, as well as the ultimate demand estimates we make, those are what you know, demographers are projecting uh, to occur based on your recent trends and what's happening in the region. The region's growing faster for certain segments that should affect the Yellow Spring. It, it doesn't get out to specific employers and the things they are doing and changing what may happen. Okay. So uh, this is a next one's a softball question. Um, you, you mentioned our high dependence on manufacturing sector, um, and I presume that's YSI or Xylem that you're referring to. Well, manufacturing overall. So okay. If, if that's probably yes. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, well, I don't really need to ask the question, but it's, uh, you know, into what sector would... We can't be sure. We, 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 we can't close the door. <laughs> O-P-E-N. <laughs> All the way up, Justin? All the way O-P-E-N. Sorry. <laughs> I was trying to be helpful. We, we appreciate it. We appreciate it. <laughs> um, so I was just going to ask Cresco Labs, what, what sector does that fall in, in your estimation? Or, and if it... If you don't know, that's okay. No, no problem. I'll go on. Because um, I said it'd be quick. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So have you se seen in your past where new housing stock, uh, particularly new apartments, and I think you just alluded to this uh, near the end of your presentation, when those new products come online, both new apartments and new houses, have you seen where... Um, that increase in the quality, uh, does that lead to, you know, existing apartments then following up with increasing quality? Because like you said, uh, when, there's, when there's a lack of inventory, uh, apartment owners don't have to do anything because, you, we, we, you know, they don't have to. Uh, they're, they're not motivated to. But have you seen where all ships rise together, if you will? Yes and no. It just depends on what's going on, what else is out in that market. So if you're in a market that you, uh, again, there's not much available, and so as your phone's a developer, I come in and I build 100 units, there might be such a pent up demand for that housing, and people will be coming in from outside, or your current residents may move there, that nothing's changing of that existing housing stock that maybe is not the best quality, because it's still staying full. I think the only time I really see that is when You've got so much product coming in that once it starts to get filled, these other ones start to go empty, and those landlords can't fill them because the demand's not there. So you, I, in my opinion, I don't know what the magic number is or tipping point, but you have to build a lot or before I think you start to see vacancies start to cascade into like those most non-conventional lower quality rentals. Mm -hmm. um, it could happen, but I think you'd have to add a lot before you start to see those become vacant, and then, then the pressure starts to come on those owners say, okay, Right. Yeah, and I was struck by as I looked through uh, the report um, on your quality assessments uh, of some of the apartments that 
seem like they're awfully low. Yeah, uh, the ones here in Yellow Springs, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we had most of them. That's like a C quality. Right. It's like a rate of A and F. And we take in landscaping, the building appearance, upkeep, all that stuff. I want to say most of them, if I'm not wrong. A lot of C's. And a lot of C's here. And that's a great point to make, Mr. Stokes. The, the surrounding area had a lot of B's. Mm -hmm. So again, if I am an outsider, as I say, I'm not familiar with the area I'm coming, I have some nicer B quality stuff that has a lot more amenities and features mm -hmm. outside of Yellow Springs, or I can come here and get a C quality product. I'm not saying about everything C, but I'm just saying, I can come here, majority is a C quality product. I'm not going to have a lot of features, and I'm going to pay about the same thing. Mm -hmm. I love this town, so maybe I'm going to choose with all things being equal in terms of price. I'll take the lower quality to live here. But maybe not. Right. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, right now you, you've got a captive market because there's just nothing available. Mm -hmm. um, but it certainly needs some housing stock, needs some better housing stock. Right. Great. Great. It doesn't mean it, it doesn't have to be A class, I think. It's right. Just it's some nice, decent, modern stuff. And I think, as I said earlier, like just millennials, uh, heck, yeah, even seniors, I mean, everybody. But millennials in particular, I just feel like everything that I've read, everything we've seen, we do resident surveys of you know all across the country. Mm -hmm. and get younger people to respond. It's they want the nicer stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, right. Understood. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Building on that, I just want to say that because our property taxes are so high, I think a lot of the landlords are getting squeezed if they're trying to keep the the uh, units relatively affordable. Um, their costs are high, and so the costs are uh, you know in the same yeah. so they're trying to keep their rents down but because their costs are high because property taxes are high they, they they've only got so much money to work with if they don't if they don't have a big cash backup or something like that you know if they're trying to make ends meet and, you know come out a little ahead um, so anyway I just wanted to say that on that but um, I wanted to ask you children living in poverty what is the income where you would say Children are living in poverty. I think, I think the federal number is like twenty-five thousand for four person. I think that's the number. Mm -hmm. So if there's four persons, it's twenty-five thousand. So it's even less than that for the family income for twenty-five percent of the children that are in Yellow Springs, not just the school system, correct? In physically in Yellow Springs. Yeah. yeah so so um, uh, Lisa ha ha gave us this sheet. So for one person, that would be twelve thousand oh, dollars. Was that on the table? No, Lisa. No, I brought it. Four oh, oh, people oh. is about twenty-five thousand. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, thanks and on that. Probably, and I don't think probably that is available. I don't think uh, check, but I don't think it's available in terms of household sizes. Like how many four persons in Yellow Spring? You know. So you got that through the schools. That number. The, power, the children. The power, no, that, that's, 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 oh, that's through the census yeah, stuff. Yeah, okay, yeah. gotcha, gotcha. Um, <laughs> I wondered if you probably don't have this, but you were talking about this. There's this uh, opportunity for people. It's really a high number. I'm kind of amazed. 1,200 people are coming in. Is that right? 1,200 yeah. people are coming into the village every, uh, every daily to work here, which is kind of amazing. But um, do we know who they are demographically? Uh, I, I, don't. I don't have that. So we don't really know incomes, uh, racial debt. Well, you should have some, some sense of what, is what you have here. I mean, if you have manufacturing mm -hmm. jobs, you have a lot of the retail stuff. I suspect some of those are uh, retail workers that are coming in, that are working in your stores and your shops and everything you have here. And some of them are probably the folks that are working at the manufacturing sector that are coming in. They can't afford, maybe they don't want to live here or whatever, can't find a place. It's probably those yeah. folks. Okay, yeah, no, I just wondered if there were any numbers. Um, when you were talking about the real estate goals, the type of housing we want to see, I guess the question I had was, you know, how do we, you know, obviously glass farm, we have total control, but private property, if we want to see a particular kind of housing, if we want to sort of have certain goals for the types of housing, um, how do you work with developers? I know you said identify developers that you, you know, might want to be coming here and looking at de doing development here. Um, are there do particular, you probably know the answer to this, but I guess just for the public, are there particular developers that if they bought the land, they would do a particular kind of housing? Well, I mean, if you, so if you want a particular kind, you try to find those developers? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. This, one of our areas that we do a lot of work in is the affordable housing, so it's a tax credit program. 
as an example. I'm not advocating it, but I'm just saying, for example, if you wanted, if you knew that there was a need for this segment of the market, those that make up the 60% of median income, the tax credit program would serve that population. Here in Ohio, there's a list, for example, that has all the developers that have applied for financing tax credits and those that have gotten awarded tax credits. If you wanted to do affordable housing for seniors, they would be able to tell who does senior tax credit but housing. If, but if you're doing market rate, are there also developers that do a particular yeah, types a of? Bit, yeah, I don't know. That might be a little bit more of a challenge to find them. Uh, but that would be a task, again, if the community moves forward, whether it's the housing committee or whoever, ultimately it's in charge of this responsibility. You could track down developers that specialize in mm -hmm. high-end market mm -hmm. rate condos for seniors with downsides, you would, you would find them. Mm -hmm. It's just the, the, the affordable housing segment, because there's a process you got to go through, right. there's lists and stuff, so when it's subsidizing tax credit, those would be easy to find. It's still needed in the market rate spectrum. It gets a little bit tougher to track them down, but there's only so many developers that can work, you know, in the region of the state or you know, a few states or something like that. Mm -hmm. Lisa, did you have? Um, yeah, I, I do. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you, and um, I appreciate the summary. And and I also find certain aspects of the report both heartening, but also very concerning, um, particularly because of the uh, poverty, uh, this sort of skew um, that makes our median fairly high in light of poverty um, in the youth. You know, and then others with high income. I found that concerning. And, and you know, my dad, I want to make sure everybody's clear. So, the, the, the number of percent of children under the age of 18 in Yellow Springs live in poverty is about 24 percent, 24 or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I checked, and I don't have, I didn't have it in here. I do not have it in the report. The numbers are in the report. But you have yeah. to do the math, mm -hmm. and that is, if you compare it with the surrounding area, you're actually lower. Right? The region, yeah. I think, is closer to 30 percent of kids live in poverty. Yeah. If you yeah. take the state of Ohio, it's probably 29 percent. So. Yeah. Relative to other places, mm. it's not out of it's not out of whack, but it's lower. But the point is, you have an affluent community. Yeah. And people sometimes they don't are unaware of this challenge the community facing. You've got kids still living. In the right. That's really well stated. Yeah. And I think another thing that, if you don't mind, <coughs> we're using the median income as opposed to a mean. I mean, the the mean, the average is might be lower. Oh, true. So then it's not so skewed if you if you look at it from a mean perspective, but you know, the standard apparently is to use median, so that's yeah. where no. I, I did have a specific question, though, about a, it was about a, a table um, about expected, it was on page uh, 32 of the um, executive summary where there was a, a prediction that there would be two um, uh, ranges of age 55 plus owner ho households by income that might be forecasted to grow. Uh, and one second, because I think you gave a yeah, uh, 32. But you have like a Roman, there's only seven. Uh, IBE 32. Oh, that's weed. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. And it was um, on that page, there's three bullets. It's the very bottom one. Yes. That it's about the surrounding area, and it says that um, uh, it's a statistic about age 55 plus owner households by income. Mm -hmm. And within the SSA, it's projected that the greatest growth over the next five years will occur among senior homeowners in two income bands. And one was between um, 75 and 99, 999, so a more affluent band. And then also notable growth projected to occur among households with incomes below 25,000. So that suggested to me that both the, you know, the most in need would be growing in, in number as well as among the most affluent. Right. And I've just wondered what the drivers were to um, to call that out. That, that is, again, the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think we're seeing that around the country where you're, you're still seeing uh, good income growth. The Cumulon is age 55 and older, so there's still wages. Mm -hmm. There's people that haven't retired yet. In fact, they probably make a big, big uh, portion of that age 55 older group is at 55 to 64. So they're working, they're, they're still having income growth, so you, you'd see that. The other one I suspect of the low income, um, and this is probably an important point to make, is um, when you've got, you know, we're senior populations, or in this case, households, senior households, and you see a jump in low income households, and, and you're like, well, why, where are all these low income seniors coming from? They're retiring. They're just retiring, so all of a sudden, they maybe make 100,000, but in the next five years, they're, they, the market are projected they're going to retire, so they go down into this low income state. <coughs> But they're not pushed out yet. They're not pushed out. No. And I think that was what really brought that to my attention, both for seniors and for other individuals, is that risk that if we continue the path we're walking, that the, the people in the lower income band, both seniors and youth and families, will get pushed out. So that, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Ben. Okay, so uh, so we've been uh, talking about this for about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, Marianne? I, I guess I would just, I, we have some people I think who came particularly for the presentation, so I'd like to give maybe five minutes. Sure. Citizens, if they have comments or questions. Maybe they don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess Uncle Mink is here. <laughs> Well, thank you for the very complete. Oh, yeah. I actually thought we were probably having a big waste of money spending the money on it, but actually, you really came up with some great figures. <laughs> that are excellent. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank, thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Almost want to applaud. It was so good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the full report is available on our website. There is a link uh, that Judy put up to uh, a PDF of the report. Um, so if anyone is interested in reading the 449 pages, uh, please feel free to access that, and um, we can hopefully get the um, PowerPoint up as well. Okay, yeah, so, so Patrick, we will be able to get that PowerPoint from you? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, I emailed it, but I think there was an issue, so I got to figure out how to get you an, a version. Um, why don't you maybe run down and make a... Actually... Do you have a flash drive? I do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if we can save it on this, that'd be great. And then Brian can And then we'll put it on the website. Excellent. Okay. Uh, Are we going to... No, no, sure. Okay, quickly. Come to the mic. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm really sorry. Well, I'm going to ask you to Patrick, I guess I was just wondering if, um, you know, when you're when you're talking about different ways that the village can be proactive in supporting certain kinds of development, and of course, in particular, I'm interested in affordable housing. Um, what have you seen as really successful strategies in other communities? Because I saw the list of recommendations, but I didn't see any specific actions like. Uh, other than just sort of promoting this. But you know, what's been really successful in actually moving the needle in other communities that you've worked in terms of like well for example with Yeah, it'd be well, best. To <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll it. Okay, so um, so the question is what what have we seen in terms of uh, what moves the needle to uh, get affordable housing built? There's so many things that, that can be done. In communities, obviously, there's different incentives and, and programs. Again, we outlined the, uh, one of the addendums, maybe J. A lot of programs that currently exist. Um, this is probably not affordable, but I'll just give you one, one example. Yeah, uh, like a public-private partnership. Again, not affordable, but I've seen communities where they're trying to figure out uh, how to attract millennials. And so one of the things they did was uh, it's in uh, Rock Island, Illinois. Uh, John Deere's headquarters is either there or close. It's a national or international headquarters for it. And one of the things they did is they worked with a nonprofit group and uh, essentially uh, made monies available for down payment assistance, assistance for their employee if they purchased a condominium somewhere in this downtown that they were trying to revitalize. 
So it doesn't get to what you're getting at, but it still is the point. Like government and the private sector can do something together to try to, to uh, push the needle, as Emily says, towards a certain kind of product. That's an example of a condominium for some condo for a millennium. It's not an affordable housing piece. But again, there's a lot of programs and, and, and efforts out there. I know the recommendations that we have, we do elaborate some on some of these ways to, to get to solving these, these different housing issues and attracting developers and so forth. But one thing that I didn't do, I did it on purpose, is I didn't go into a lot of detail because I need I want this community to have the flexibility to say, well Patrick says we need to do affordable senior housing and this is the way to do it. Well that's that would be negligent on me because there's too many ways to address you know a specific housing need. And so that's Thanks. All right, thanks. Well, clearly there are some important next steps, uh, the focus groups, certainly, and, um, and we've got a lot to digest, and I imagine we'll have a lot more questions, so, and, and uh, want more feedback. Thanks again. And, and Patrick, you don't have to stay through the rest of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you can go home to your wife. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we don't have any old business, so let's move into new business. And the first thing uh, under new business is to uh, look at our boards and commissions. Thanks for coming, Hank. Um, and so I think the, uh, uh, the way we've done this in the past is just to kind of run down the list, uh, see what folks are interested in. And obviously we did talk about um, some of our preferences at the retreat. Um, so the list, I have a uh, list planning commission, commission first. Um, so. Can it be scheduled to Wednesday? But oh yeah, so Judy, did we find out anything about that? We still have one person that cannot ever do a Wednesday, so uh, we're still in negotiation. Okay, so at this point it's, it's still second Mondays. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, it, it, it could potentially change. But we're still, that person and I are still exchanging some emails, but um, at council could certainly make the decision to make that change. You might lose that individual, or you might have that individual there less frequently. You do have alternates in place. That can be a council decision if you choose to make it. Um, that's where it stands. Okay. Well, I'm willing to be the lead on planning commission. Uh, I mean, if someone else wants to jump onto it, that's fine. Um, yeah, I, I was also interested in, in the Planning Commission and just really because of my commitment to the World House Choir um, that rehearses on Monday nights. Um, you know, but I don't think we should change the date and time since it's an, it's an effective functioning commission, but I would be glad to be the alternate. Even with the Monday? Well, do you think that the alternate needs to be at every meeting for planning? We talked about ta watching the tape. If I didn't have to be at every meeting, um, I would certainly be glad to um, miss my other commitment and put that first. I would be glad to do that. But I defer to the expertise of those of you who are more familiar. No. Who? Judy, do you have a sense about that? Because well, the alternate has not regularly attended in any at any time in the past, and when there's been a carryover hearing where, and it's it's rare, but if the alternate has had to step in for the council representative, they have been able to catch up and legally come and sit in that seat and proceed with a second part of a hearing if they've watched the tape, read the minutes, and brought themselves up to speed. Okay, all right. Um, so, so, have we made a decision? Yes, so it sounds like you will so, be the okay. liaison and uh, Lisa will be the alternate. Um, okay, Economic Sustainability Commission. I'd be interested in being the liaison for Economic Sustainability. Great, um, and how about an alternate? How many, um, so I'm thinking of two commissions for liaison and two-ish 
as alternate? What's the, is there a standard? I think that's, I might say that's a minimum. <laughs> <laughs> and it, when is it? Two or three. Uh, uh, the first Wednesday, um, and it's uh, 7 to 830. So that, that commission does meet for strictly an hour and a half. <clears throat> okay. So are you I'm, interested, Judith? I can't do that day because oh, okay. I work some Wednesdays. Okay. I mean, if push comes to shove, and we have, you know, the, I was the backup liaison to planning commission previously, you know, in order in terms of breaking it up. I'm not, you know, that's, I don't know that it's exactly my strong suit, but if everybody else is ending up with too many Mondays or, you know, a night that I can come. Okay. Is all I'm saying. Okay. So. Okay. So we're still looking for an alternate for ESC. Yeah. Are Alter you interested? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Community access panel. Liaison. Okay. Great. And um, I think it makes sense for me to be the alternate, given that I have background um, when it was not on hiatus. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to do that. Uh, Arts and Culture Commission. I'd be very interested in being the liaison. Excellent. Um, and I, I think I sort of committed to being the alternate. Uh, it's a fun commission. Um, okay, how about energy board? So why don't I stay on that? Great. And uh, an alternate for energy board? I'll take it. Um, okay, library commission. I'll, why don't I stay on that? Okay, and an alternate? I'll take it if it's available. <laughs> All right. All right. You're interested in everything. <clears throat> I'm, I'm trying to go above the minimum. <laughs> oh, see. Well, you're, at, you're at the minimum right now. Uh, no, no, okay. I got one more. I got, I got one more in the bullpen. Okay. Uh, Justice System Task Force. I would like to remain the liaison. Okay. Um, right now, I am the, I've been the alternate. Does anyone else? Is anyone else interested in being alternate? I would be interested in being the alternate if, because of your other commitments, that you know if you want to move off of it. Yeah, I have two other big ones that I'm going to be the right. lead on. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, village mediation. Yeah, I, I would like to continue with that. And we have not had an alternate for. Village mediation? No, we haven't. I'd be glad to be an alternate. Uh, mediation program meets sort of irregularly yeah. once a quarter or so. Yeah, I'd be glad to be a part of it. Okay. Uh, then I've got the school board liaison. And I have been doing that. And would you like to continue? Um, yeah, I'm happy to do that, but I think it could be more effective um, liaison with um, like meeting with the school board president and a school board member or something. I, I'm not convinced that it's been particularly effective. Okay. Well, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about that. I don't know if that means being an alternate, but, um, yeah, I'd like to work with you on that. Um, Human Relations Commission. I'll take liaison. Okay. All right, Patty, did I make it? <laughs> Okay. Made it. And, and I, I'm uh, going to be the alternate for okay. that since All I've right. been being the lead on that. All right, good. Okay. Environmental commission? I'd like to continue being the uh, lead on that. Great. And, uh, and we'll an alternate? An alternate. What day is it? Environmental. Uh, Thursday, the third Thursday of the month. If you need an alternate, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Okay. Usually, usually we don't, or I don't. Yeah. And uh, Beaver Management Task Force, are we leaving <laughs> so that? That, that, that would just be part of the environment. Okay. Um, the thing that we haven't done is the housing. Yes, and, that, and I have that written down. Okay. Um, but we can do that next. So. Um, the housing. I'd like to make. continue being the, well, the a council rep on that. Okay. I would be interested. Good. Okay. And then um, the last three that I have, so we've got Green County Regional Planning Commission, 
Um, I am happy to do that. Um, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission uh, also, I think my background would be suitable for those. Do you need an alternate? Um, we yes. haven't had an alternate. If so, it should be the vice president. <laughs> oh, there you go. It's It's got to be staff. Oh, it, oh, it can't oh. actually be a council person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's Patty? It, well, or, normally it's Denise, actually. Denise, okay. <laughs> and um, then... I was going to say thank you. If we continue to have a chamber liaison, if the chamber decides, um, I'm happy to do that as well. Okay. So I leave anything out? All right. Great. Okay. Everybody's happy. Awesome. Okay. Okay. So then um, we also have under new business a report out um, on the retreat. And uh, actually, for me, uh, I think this is going to be pretty brief because I do think uh, the minutes did a nice job of capturing what we talked about. But uh, I made a couple notes to highlight. Um, one of those being uh, that there was a lot of discussion around 2017 being a very intense year. And I think that was true for staff. It was true for council. And um, what really resonated with me in our discussion was the need to prioritize to be more strategic and to really think about kind of things like what we did tonight with really digging deep on the housing needs assessment. And I, I think that is something that uh, all of the village team is committed to. And so we'll continue to work on that. Um, obviously, there were things that happened in 2017 that required us to be in high gear. Um, and there's still a lot going on, but we cannot sustain uh, <coughs> that amount of work. Um, second thing was uh, being more, I guess, purposeful about commissions adding capacity and making sure that our commissions actually have a purpose. And so I think that's something that now that we've got our assignments, we can all evaluate where we're at with those commissions. Um, we also talked about uh, a specific process for commission members when they have a complaint or an issue. And um, one of the things that, we'll, that is on our agenda for February 5th is to start digging more into commission and board processes and procedures. So we will revisit that. <coughs> and then the fourth thing that I highlighted was um, more input from citizens on goals. And that's the other primary topic for our February 5th meeting. Um, we've talked about potentially some kind of online application that we could <laughs> use. And so <clears throat> I'll bring something to the meeting to show what that might look like. Um, and so I, I want us all to be thinking about how we can get that engagement. Because if, in fact, we are going to prioritize whatever input we can get to make sure we're prioritizing correctly uh, would be important. Um, so those were kind of the highlights I had. Uh, does anyone want to add anything about the retreat? Marianne? Well, I'd like to add something that I didn't actually get a chance to say at the retreat, but I had wanted to. And it's about how to make some of the staff reports more effective. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking, thinking about police, planning, and mayor. To me, what would be very helpful is for those reports where they're saying like the number of arrests, the number of new houses, or the number of cases heard in court, that those be on a kind of spreadsheet that compare whether it's, and I don't think these have to be monthly either. I think quarterly for all three of these reports would be fine. But that they compare them to the previous quarter, the previous year, so we see what's happening <laughs> Just getting a number for a particular time period, to me, is sort of meaningless. Mm -hmm. So I would like it if we could. We can certainly do the police and the planning that way. The mayor is, is well, entirely different. I mean, I don't have any. We can make that request of the but, mayor. Though. But yes, and I, I or can. Or the mayor's clerk or whatever. I can, uh, I can certainly talk to, uh, to Brian and Denise and ask them if they can 
change the format of that and so that it's a continuing and to continuing updated spreadsheet. I mean, do other people on council, does that seem like I think it's a terrific idea? idea. Yeah. yeah, I definitely yeah. agree. And I wonder with the justice system task force talking about the mayor's court, if, you know, that could be. Um, I was going to say, I was going to, I, I felt like I should give the mayor a call because there's, you know, we have this committee where we're looking at the mayor's court, but we have a, a mayor and a new mayor who's got new ideas. And, you know, I, I kind of was trying to think we've got this overlap, which, you know, might be useful for us to talk with the mayor about. We do the budget, we provide the budget, but um, she, you know, is thinking about the practices. And they do overlap when you think if you're thinking about a prosecutor or, you know, there's any number of issues where we might have an overlap there. And so I thought from time to time we might, or maybe soon, and, or anyway, I was thinking about that relative to the justice system because we're beholding, the task force is, to counsel. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we're a little bit getting in an area where counsel does not have oversight. So. You know, I wanted to talk to, I know Pam is open and interested and I new ideas and all of that, but you know what I mean? It's a little, I started thinking about, you know, their, you know, just that little issue. <laughs> well, so maybe we'll come back and, and think about that more. But you, were, but you were bringing up Justice System Task Force relative to? Maybe just starting that, you, you know, thinking about this issue of how reporting could tie into, um, some of the things that I think are being discussed, like restorative justice and that sort of, you know, what we might get into. Um, okay, and then we have one other piece of new business, which is um, a nomination. So, Marianne. Yeah. Um, Nick Cunningham has been on the uh, HRC for one term, and he would like to uh, have a second term. Nick, I think, is a good representative for people with uh, differently abled people, and um, he performs that function. He's been a co-facilitator, and he's also been working with the police on, well, I think they call it neighbor to neighbor program, where identifying people in a neighborhood who need help so that the police know that, so that the neighbors know that. At any rate, he would, as I said, uh, he would like to stay on. Uh, Brian and I did interview him for a second term, and so I'd like to nominate him. For all a second. second term. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Patty. Okay, um, a reminder that uh, beginning next Monday, uh, Denise is going to be working full time. Her hours are going to be 8 to 4 in the planning and zoning office um, instead of 9 to 3, so she'll be there a few extra hours. Um, and so um, we just want to make sure folks know that you know they don't have to wait until 9 o'clock to, uh, to come in. Um, I want to echo Brian's thanks to the crews for all the work that they've been doing in, in um, between the cold weather that caused all of the the main breaks and the sewer backups and the outages and then the snow on top of it and it, they have just been really working really hard um, and I just want them to know how much we really appreciate uh, what they have been doing. Um, chili, chili soup cook-off. Could I ask a <laughs> yes, comment to, to that point? Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess some of the issues probably are old infrastructure. Yes. Um, would, would, do you think that, cli that climate change, I mean, the erratically changing temperatures yes. get low temperatures? Is that yes. That that definitely when you get the freezing and thawing and the freezing and thawing on the, in the ground, that definitely causes the main breaks. And um, if, when you add to that the fact that we have an, an exceptionally old infrastructure that, you know, parts of it are new, but parts of it are really old, um, and, um, you know, one of the things that the EPA is going to start pushing um, smaller communities to do is to begin to upgrade that infrastructure. Um, and so that is part, Marianne, when you combine those two things um, and those extreme temperatures that we've been having, then we warm up and then it gets cold again. Mm -hmm. And then we warm up and we're going to do it this week. I mean, by the end of the week, we're supposed to be well, at 50 degrees. It will continue happening. Right, and that does uh, that does directly affect the main breaks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
So the chili soup cook-off, um, for the two new members of council, um, we, we started doing this a few years ago. And uh, what we do is all of the uh, employees who wish to do so uh, create an entry in a crock pot. We all meet in A and B. Um, everyone gets to have, you know, whatever for lunch, soup, chili, whatever there is. And there's usually a combination. But council members are normally our judges. <laughs> And um, so what we would like for you to do is start looking for a couple dates next week we, or next month. We usually try to have it on a Friday. Um, all of the employees just come in for AB. It's a good time. Council sits up there with little paper cups full of different uh, soups with numbers on them. And uh, it's a blind, it's a blind thing. You don't know who created what until the end of the day. Um, so um, look at your Fridays. Let me know when you might be available um, on Fridays next month. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Great. Thanks. Melissa? Sounds stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan was very disappointed when just I got right him. Now. It's, it's awesome. It's like the elf judging. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got a couple of things. Um, lodging tax update. Um, just to remind everyone that um, applications for uh, transient lodging permits are due by the end of January if you have already been in operation. Um, otherwise, you have uh, up until 30 days after you have uh, been up and operating to uh, submit that application. So if you are an existing lodging establishment in town, um, then you do have up until January 31st to get that permit in. So there is an application, a print uh, print version um, on the village website and there's also an online um, version. Um, to find the online information at the very top of YSO.com there's a find it fast. Um, this is the quickest way to get there. In that drop down of find it fast there's a uh, there's a link that says lodging tax information that will take you to the page where it has everything. So that page is up and active. Um, there is a $25 application fee which was passed by council a little bit uh, later in the in the year. Um, so that that fee is not able to be submitted online but um, you can submit that um, by a check or a credit card at the utility office window when you uh, put in your permit application. Um, tax forms, uh, I had a discussion about that today. The tax forms will be available once the filing period gets closer. I'm hoping that next month I can have those tax forms available in draft form so that I could get some feedback from the community so that they're easy to understand and um, everybody uh, everybody uh, has some input as to the people or input for the people that are going to be filing and using those. Um, I'm also going to have open office hours um, for anybody that wants to come in and ask questions or get answers um, from myself regarding the new tax. There is a typo in my report. Um, the open office hours will be this Thursday, the 18th of January from 12 to 3 p.m. And there will also be open office hours on Wednesday, January 24th from 9 a.m. to noon. So you can just come down to the utility office window and you can just ask for me. And I'll be uh, willing to answer any questions that any, anybody might have and get everybody started with their permit application. And um, Denise will be uh, available to accept those as well. Um, once it gets closer to the filing period, I will also have open office hours at that time too so that people can come in and ask questions um, ahead of the filing period. So I, I plan to do that again. And if, if this is well received and it seems like um, I need to have some more open office hours, then I'll do that too. I was going to do a kind of an FAQ, um, but I feel like at first maybe these open office hours so people can come and sit down and talk one-on-one -on -one might be a better better option but if if we need uh, an FAQ or anything like that um, more formal then I'm, I'm definitely willing to do that as well and can we promote that on the yes. Facebook page yep I was website? writing okay. myself notes to make sure that I push that stuff out tomorrow I was trying to log into the back end of the website and I, I don't have my information saved on this computer okay. Um, so the other piece that I had was Brian sent a rental information. I'd gotten the policies um, from Samantha, who's um, our main monitor down in the in the youth center. So that's a, that was supposed to be attached um, along with uh, the rental reservation form and guidelines and responsibilities. So 
that was passed out at each place because somehow it didn't make it into the electronic packet um, and then I had some out on the table as well so that information is available for council to review. Okay and if we can put that uh, Judy in the packet for February 5th that'd be great. And then the utility billing software conversion, we are finally doing our um, parallel that's going to start tomorrow. The utility billing office will close at 2 tomorrow because we are supposed to have our data extraction um, that's going to go over into the new system at 2.30 in the afternoon. So um, we will be doing that tomorrow. So the utility billing office will be um, closed for accepting payments at 2 o'clock. Um, the staff will still be there to be able to take calls and answer questions and everything, but we will be doing that, uh, that data extraction. So we will be doing a parallel for a month, which means that everything that we do in uh, the new system, we have to do in the old system just in case. So it's going to be twice as much work. So um, anybody that comes to the window um, during that time period, I just ask for patience because everything's going to have to be a duplicate entry. Um, I'm confident, though, that this new system is going gonna, is gonna to be so much better. So we're, we're getting really close, and I'm excited about that. And then the last piece of that is, again, I just want to announce that the utility office window hours are now open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. And that's it for me. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. Um, okay, uh, the chief is not here. He's at training, um, but he did note that he is now interviewing uh, new officers. And Judy? I don't have anything <clears throat> other than business as usual. Great. So future agenda items. Um, I think our next meeting is going to be pretty full with looking at boards and commissions and uh, 2018 goals. Um, and then other items that have come up are have a holding place on February 20th. Um, that have not been uh, priorities thus far. But I will say related to the taser policy, um, I know that uh, Chief Carlson and Sergeant Knapp want to talk about, um, what's it called, Expol? Uh, Lexapol. Lexapol. Um, their new uh, best practices policy, uh, I, I guess, generator. And um, so I think that's going to be very interesting. I, I had a great discussion with the chief about this. And um, so uh, are we okay with that being on the 20th, Judith? Or do you want to so, put that on? So the I didn't understand. Did you? Uh, I know that Ellis has looked at the Luxapol. Yes. And it's problematical <clears throat> from our from it is in terms of the kind of change we wanted to see. Okay, it does not accomplish it. Okay, <laughs> so um, uh, so you know in terms of the recommendation of the committee. <clears throat> so I don't know what are you suggesting? Are we having that discussion on the twentieth, or I mean, uh, sh should we ask Ellis to come and? Could I make a suggestion because yes. uh, these two, the Chief and I talked about this briefly, and and from what he was telling me that. The the meaning of the the way he's reading it, the meaning of both of the policies gets you to the same point. It's just that one of them does that with active language, or language the other one does it with passive language. I'd like to suggest that maybe you, Ellis Chief, and I sit down and talk about it and see right. if we can. Okay. Because I'd like to understand. Well, the under, our understanding was Lexapol was going to be. Uh, I mean, this way Chief had meant, talked about it, that it was going to be a, uh, a framework and it's got these recommended policies, but that we could, we could individualize it by our community you right. know, values. Yeah. So, but I think it's good to have a meeting. Yeah, that I sounds think, like yeah, a good if, idea. Yeah, if we could do that, that would be great. But are we talking about then bringing it back to council at some point? Um, That's what yeah, I'm I mean, sure I, I do want you know, it to be institutionalized as a resolution once we get to you know, where we want it to be. So I don't know if we'll be ready on the 20th or not. The 20th of February? Yeah. I don't either. Okay. <laughs> but okay. we'll get a chance to talk about it at the next meeting, right? Good, yeah. good. Any other items? Yes. Yes, Marian. I would like to start having a regular report out for housing. Okay. And, and I'm hopeful that we could have a, our team meeting between now and the next council meeting and that we would have a report. Great. Okay. Do Anything need, else? Do we need Ordinance 2018-03 on 20th? Uh, Placeholder? Well, let, 
We are. Do you want to move it up to that? No, the stay goes until the 24th, so I wasn't quite sure how you wanted to play that. My short answer is I'd like to see how it evolves. I doubt it will be ready for anything on the 5th, but it should be placeholder on the 20th. Okay, got it. Okay, good. Anything else? Lisa? It is a, a commission or some other group starting to think about next steps based on the housing report? How are we there's that along? there's this housing committee, uh, committee so that group will take yeah. it next. so we'll be bringing yeah okay perfect so it's kind of a it's an advisory committee um, under the uh, a village manager as opposed to a board or commission right thank okay thanks okay but uh, actually the environmental commission we had our retreat on Sunday and we did we did a risk risk of, we're doing a risk assessment of environmental issues and the housing thing that's oh. one of the things mm -hmm. that came. Anything else? Okay, well, I will take a motion to adjourn. Moved. Okay. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And my clock says 9.30. Oh, my gosh. All right. All right. All right. Let's yeah, shoot for 9 o'clock oh, next time. Aye. <laughs> 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 <laughs>